anthem performed by Sergeant Byron Bartosh of the Indiana National Guard. We are blessed, O oh Lord, to be able to assemble here at the motor racing capital of the world to enjoy one of the most important events in all of sports. Thank you for this venue and race. We pray for the safety of every participant and spectator. We also are blessed, O oh Lord, with the endowment to the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you for these privileges, and we pray that they will not be taken for granted. And then, Lord, we are blessed to live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you for America. We pray for our military personnel around the world who, with determination and sacrifice, defend our nation and bring freedom to others. God bless America, and may America bless God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We'd like to take this opportunity to recognize and honor the brave men and women of our U.S. Armed Services, especially those serving overseas. And if you'd like to learn more about how you can show your support for our troops and their families, log on to americasupportsyou.mil. It is almost showtime. A purse in excess of nine and a half million dollars on the line today at the Fame Brickyard as we go to Jerry Punch and the gang. Take it away, Doc. Uh, thank you very much, Britt. You know, in golf and tennis, there really are only a handful of events that could be considered majors, but while the Daytona 500 may be the crown jewel of stock car racing, most would agree that this one right here is a very close second. Now, Rusty, for 12 consecutive years here, you stood where those drivers are standing right now, getting ready to climb through that window and buckle up those belts. What are they thinking right now, getting ready to, to compete here at a place like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Well, Jerry, I finished second in this event three times, and I'll tell you what, every single night, didn't sleep hardly at all. All these drivers right now, they're probably nervous. They're thinking about tire wear. They're thinking about how's their car going to handle. There's a ton of things on your mind, but I can tell you one thing. Last night, they didn't sleep. You finished second here three times. One of those finished second place finishes with this guy here, Dale Earnhardt, uh, senior's crew chief when you won here in 95. Andy Petrie, what is the biggest challenge that faces a crew chief here today? It's about risk versus reward. How much are you willing to risk to win the race? Are you willing to risk maybe running out of gas, taking a chance on fuel, finishing 30th? That could kill your chances in the chase. And that's the kind of thing. This race does not come to you. You have to go get it. And how much are you willing to gamble to go get it? So you have to lay it on the line to win this race. One thing is for sure, if you win here at Indy, you will never forget it, and no one will ever forget you. It just means that much to win at a place like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. NASCAR Nextel Cup Allstate 400 at the Brickyard brought to you by Allstate, official insurance sponsor of NASCAR. Sprint, enter the Sprint Speed Million Sweepstakes presented by Motorola at Sprint.com forward slash speed. Toyota. Of the, tra the traditions and be a part of the spectacle that is racing here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Now let's go trackside for the command to get things started. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if we could have your attention, please. Now to say the most famous words in motorsports, the chairperson of the board of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mary Holman George. Gentlemen, start your engines. have fired and NASCAR's finest understand what happens next. It is a race at a place that has earned its reputation as one of the world's greatest sports venues. The twin spires of Churchill Downs. The grass of Wimbledon's center court. Symbols as fundamental to the history and lore of a sport as the great champions who have won on these grand stages. One of the most venerated of these symbols is found here in Indiana on a track both accurately and reverently called the Brickyard. of civilization, a demonstration of man's will over nature. From the simplest of ingredients comes a raw power of which great things are built. Enter this hallowed track and you realize, no matter how much times change, some things stay the same. Is tough. Fired up is fired up. And a finish line is a finish line. Victory here is a precise process. Get it right, and you'll stand the test of time. Get it wrong, and it spells disaster. This grand palace is built of brick and motor, grit and speed. Despite conventional wisdom, the pieces don't always fit together, all from a single mold, but each with its own drive. To defend their title, cement their place in history, battle on their home turf, and build their own legend. They all come to this place of spectacle for a single purpose, because it is only in July in Indiana that a hardcore man-made stone looks good enough to kiss. Motor is Speedway, and the cars are rolling away, so it's time for us to take a look at the starting grid. It is an all-chip Ganassi front row led by 21-year-old Reed Sorts, who becomes the youngest pole sitter in the history of this Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Beside him, we're talking about his rookie teammate. Yeah, he's a NASCAR rookie, but he also won the Indy 500 back in 2000. That is Juan Pablo Montoya. The starters across the top of your screen, you can pick out where your favorite driver is starting. And while you watch that, one of my favorite parts of the pre-race coverage, when we get some final stories from our pit reporter down in the trenches. First, let's start with Mike Massaro. Well, thanks, Doc. You know, Matt Kenseth says anytime he comes to Indianapolis, he feels like he has a legitimate shot to win. Well, to get to victory lane, though, today he'll need a record-breaking performance. The furthest back any eventual Brickyard winner has started, 27th. But after struggling in practice and qualifying on Saturday, Matt Kenseth finds himself 35th, 31st rather, on the grid right now. But there is reason for optimism. He's driving a car specifically built for Indianapolis, a car he raced here a year ago and finished second with. Guys? Well, we're honored to have as our in-race reporter the driver of the Budweiser Chevrolet who starts on the outside of row two four spot. Let's visit with Dale Earnhardt Jr. Dale Jr., Rusty Wallace, ESPN, you got me? Yes, sir. Dale, I'll tell you what, buddy, you qualified great. You look really good in practice. But you know how much winning this race meant to your dad. Man, what would it mean to you if you could win this thing? 
Well, considering when you want to race, it seems like forever, it'd be awesome. Especially at the Brickyard. Brickyard's a big deal on the circuit. So I've been uh, spending all week uh, thinking about it. So I'm ready to get done. All right, buddy. Have a great race. Thank you, ma'am. All right, let's visit with his crew chief, who also happens to be his cousin, Tony Urie Jr. Hey, Tony Jr., Andy up here in the booth, you got a copy? Go ahead, Andy. Hey, crew chiefs are usually the ones with all the answers, but there's a lot of questions down there today. What's the biggest unknown for you to, going into this race? Well, the biggest thing is you just got to keep yourself in position and keep our track position. We worked hard Friday to get, and uh, when it comes down here to 40 to go, you know how the strategy can really change up and get track position. So. Uh, my biggest deal is just seeing where we're at and if we're in a winning position to, to make the right call here at the end. I think this is one of the biggest races and the hardest ones to call of the year. 10-4, I know you do a great job. Good luck, Tony. Thank you, bud. Well, I look forward to hearing from those guys all day long. As we check in back in the pits with more stories, here's Dave Burns. Well, Doc, uh, Indy's a tough place to race, and Denny Hamlin only has one start at this track, but don't count out his experience at Pocono Raceway, a track that one corner anyway acts very much like the high-speed corners here at Indy. He swept both races last year at Pocono. He led 49 laps earlier this year, and success at Pocono can translate to success here at Indy. Crew Chief Mike Ford told me this morning, we've got a package for speed at this type of racetrack. We are just fine, F-I-N-E, fine adjustments away from a great race car for Denny. Jamie? Well, Dave, since earlier in the week in that Gin Racing DEI merger announcement and the fact that Dale Earnhardt Jr. is leaving DEI at the end of the year, there's been a lot of added pressure and maybe attention on Martin Truex Jr. And for good reason. He got his first cup win just a month ago, and he's 11th in the points. That's better than the other two DEI cars. But asked about that extra attention, he said, I think it's amazing. I want to be the face of DEI. I want to be that guy. Alan? Well, for drivers like Clint Boyer, 10th in points and on the bubble for making the championship chase, today's race is a delicate balance between protecting their place in the championship and trying to win at Indianapolis. Boyer's day complicated by the fact that his team had to change an engine this morning. By NASCAR rule, they dropped to the back of the pack for the start of this race. Win the race, but protect your place in the chase. It's going to be a tough way to do that both times here at uh, Indianapolis today. Doc? All right, guys, thank you very much. You know, when these cars go off and take this green flag and go sailing down in a turn uh, one, Andy, things can get real messy in a hurry. Doc, it's really funny. This track is so clean and pristine, but there is one thing that's always dirty around here, and that's the air. The only person that can feel that clean air today is going to be the guy out in front. And I'll tell you what, you're going to try to use that air at your advantage all day long. You're going to try to use it to get that car to the front. You know, there was one guy everyone said could actually see the air. And Andy, you took in the two championships and the Brickyard victory. Jerry Dale Earnhardt was amazing with air. He could always take advantage of it. And for the first time ever through ESPN Draft Track, you'll be able to see what they say only Dale Earnhardt could air. Draft tracks will show you the effect, the positive and negative effects that air has on cars running together. The bright yellow air is where the car, where the air hits the car and changes direction, creating downforce and pressure we always talk about. I tell you, that blue air, that's the air, that's a turbulent air. You've got to use that to your advantage, too, but it's very turbulent. You use that to draft up on it. It's just amazing and incredible. You can actually see the air coming off the car. Now, yesterday, pole sitter Reed Sorensen, uh, he cut through the air quicker than anybody. We didn't show this yesterday, but here's what it looked like. Air going over his car, the quickest of the month. He was making that air go fast over his car yesterday, and you can see the effect of it right there. All right, guys, the car is now lining up uh, on the racetrack behind the Chevrolet pace car. Andy, what should we watch for here today? Well, tire wear is going to be a big deal right here to start the race because the track is very green still. So these cars running real fast down these corners. These guys are going to be really worried about it early. And then the different fuel strategies. We've got an 18 gallon fuel cell, long race. And like we heard Tony Jr. saying down there, there's going to be some strategies at the end of the race that people are going to be trying and searching for that clean air. We just talked about that and managing that draft and trying to find that clean air is going to be key. Gambling with two tires late for track position. You won't see that early, but you might see that right at the end of the race for these guys to try to jump that track position. All right. It is a 400 mile race. We will have eight high definition onboard cameras. We'll ride along with eight different drivers throughout the field throughout the afternoon, and you'll get high definition views of what's happening around this massive two and a half mile facility, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway.
Well, decades ago, 3.2 million bricks laid the foundation for a race course where ordinary men could become legends by simply winning a single race in a single day. Nine drivers in this field know what it feels like to win here. The other 34 want to. 250,000 diehard stock car fans are on their feet. Folks, grab a hold of those steering wheels and hang on because the All-State 400 is underway. The pole sitter has led the whole first lap here in each and every All-State 400. Can Reed Sorensen hang on, but they're shifting to the inside down there. The 31 car, that's Jeff Burton making a pass. Guys, the main thing, they got off to start and it's clean. Reed Sorensen's got the lead with Montoya right behind him right now. And the aerodynamics is so important at this racetrack and getting the tire pressures up, guys. That's one big thing they got to do but before they start maneuvering around and make some bad passes. Dale Earnhardt Jr. on the inside right now, Montoya. Montoya just about catches the wall. We see Dale Jr. pouncing early here. He's going to try to get that track position because it's so important to jump on these guys early so you can get it. If you get caught back there, you're going to be caught in that dirty air. Earnhardt Jr. makes the pass. He told a lot of people, including us, before the race today that he's had the best car he's ever had here at Indianapolis. He told me last night, I said, Rusty, this car is so maneuverable. I really love it. I think I can win this race. And he is doing it right now. He's running good, running down. Reed Sorensen down at the moment. Now, these guys are just feeling their cars out. They know we're going to have a caution with, at about lap 15. NASCAR is going to throw a competition yellow so we can look at these tires and these guys can get a, a read on it. And there's the 20 car, Tony Stewart, who won here in 2005, squeaking to the inside of the 16 car. Right now, the exit of turn three, that's a great place to pass before you get down to four. And Stewart took advantage of it now. Coming off of turn four, guys, one key part of the racetrack, getting that straightaway speed down the front straightaway, over 200 miles an hour. Well, we're seeing a four wide here at this, on the front straightaway. And that was the 29 car, Kevin Harvick, the veteran here who won it in 2003, going all the way to the inside groove, almost against the pit wall to make that pass. Sure, they might be three wide down the straightaway, but they got to get single file before they get into one or turn three. This racetrack is not double wide going at those corners. They can make these passes off the corner and into straightaways. Here comes Tony Stewart again, looking to the inside to make a pass. So much for patience early on. Oh, yeah, he's got no patience right now. He's got a good handling car, and he's using his advantage. He's really got a lot of straightaway uh, speed also. Dave, you got more? Yeah, Rusty, talking to Greg Zipidelli, crew chief for Tony early this morning. He told me, you know what? I'm a big believer that if you build a car that's great aero-wise, responds to changes, and the driver likes, run it to death, run it everywhere. And this is the same exact car that Tony went to victory lane with two weeks ago in Chicago. He likes it, and he's comfortable with it, and it is fast. How often do you hear that a guy driver wins in a car and suddenly that car becomes his favorite? Oh, I tell you what, it's like a favorite pair of shoes. You want to use it all the time. And if he's got a car that's running this good, hey, why not? And he's got a good car and he's not afraid to use it right here. He's going under Brian Newman. He's going to get down in the corner and try to outbreak him into the corner here. He might get the two for one. He's good looking inside the 25 car. Well, right now, that's the right, right move. You know, Newman's on the outside, Stewart on the inside. They can't go double wide. You know that somebody on the outside's got a lift right now. Yeah, you see how, how smart Tony is there. He backed off, waited for his opportunity to get off the corner and pass Casey Mears. You see this group passing down. Now watch them spreading out in the top of the green. J.J. Yaley going all the way to the inside in a backup car. He lost his primary car in qualifying in practice. But Jerry, he wants to get to the inside right now as it makes a pass on the 19 car. He got to the inside right there. He's a little timid right now because he lost his main car. He's feeling himself back up in this race. Now right behind J.J. Yaley is the guy who won this race a year ago, the reigning cup champion. There's the 48 car of Jimmy Johnson. He looks to be a little more patient early on than some of the other guys up front. When we talked to Jimmy before the race. He said, man, I hate practicing here. I hate qualifying here, but I love racing here. And that showed last year when he won this race. Alan, you got more? Yeah, I talked to Ron Malik, who's serving as crew chief for this 48 car. Remember that his primary crew chief, Chad Knauss, is still under suspension by NASCAR for a rules violation. Ron basically agreed with what you said about Jimmy Rusty. He said Jimmy is a guy who really likes 
to chase people. You get him in the race, he's really good at getting behind someone, figuring out where his car is better than theirs, and how to make a pass. That's what Jimmy's doing right now. He dropped a couple of spots on the start, but he's picked those back up and is starting to move forward. It's such a rhythm racetrack, too. And when Jimmy does, he gets in that rhythm in the race. You can see him now working on J.J. Yaley off the corner. He just he, he just gets that rhythm and he works these guys and keeps working. Yeah, this would be for 18th position. And Jimmy Johnson spent the entire practice session or most of the practice, in fact, the, the entire practice session yesterday working on race setup. Didn't didn't focus at all on qualifying. Well, Jerry, we kept looking at him in practice. Well, look, he's way down. He's 48th fast in practice. What's going on? We were almost wanting to write him off, but he said, "Look, I hate this. I'm going to have a good car. Just watch." Aren't these guys in the back trying to hustle their way to the front? And speaking of up front, Reed Sorensen, the 21-year-old from Peachtree City, Georgia. You heard correctly. He became the youngest pole sitter in the almost century-old history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The young man had a dream come true, his first pole when it comes in the biggest venue of all. There's rubber and and dirt and sand and everything else and you don't care one bit it's just another part of the whole prestige of winning it's just such a great feeling to experience what it's like to win in indy really don't think there's any other experience like it and one of the great traditions actually began with a suggestion in victory lane by todd parrott and dale jarrett and the old crew uh, went over to kiss the bricks and the 31 car Jeff Burton getting a little racy and takes a spot away from Juan Pablo Montoya. Okay, well, this guy's always got a great handle on Carl. We talked about it earlier to show that he's one of the guys doesn't like qualifying, but he loves the race. You can always count on him to have a good handle on car. And right now, he's past Montoya, pulled into third position. Another guy on the move right here is that 24 car. Just coming in your pitcher. He's been moving st steadily up in the field now. He's up to the uh, ninth spot now. He was in 11th last lap. He made up two spots here in one lap. He's on the move. Yeah, he came from 21st spot to ninth in 11 laps. You think Jeff Gordon's on a march? And how about the 01 car, Mark Martin? Well, Mark Martin, this is the car that he crashed in Chicago. He really loves this car. He told me last night, he said, look, count on me. Get to the front of this pack pretty quick because I got a good looking car. And I got a great handling car too. Arla for more on Mark Martin. Let's check in his pitch with Jamie Little. Well, Doc, a lot has been going on with this team, as I mentioned a little bit ago, joining forces, of course, with DEI. But there's six teams involved, but they've gone to a four-car team. That means two teams must dissolve. I talked to DEI. The teams are going to get together this week. They're going to decide what people will stay and what crew members will have to go. It's kind of a hard time, as you can imagine, at home. You're working in an office, they merge together, all of a sudden you don't know if you're going to have a job starting next week or not. So kind of heavy hearts and heads laid low on that 01 crew, keeping their fingers crossed, guys. They will have a job when everything is decided. A lot of unknowns down there among those teams, Jamie. A lot of merger talk and some partnership talk ongoing and some other unknowns here right now, Andy Petrie. We are three laps away from that competition yellow and these crew chiefs and crew members have got to be thinking what's going on with the tire situation. Well, they're, just, they're really hoping they can make it this 15 laps because that's going to stretch it for some of these guys. Some of them in practice could only go six or seven laps before they had cord showing. So they're just hoping they can get in there without blowing a tire out and then the track should rubber in and be fine later. Well, I tell you, the guy not running well right now is Ryan Newman. He slipped from the front to the back of the pretty far back right now. He keeps losing ground. He can't hold the car on the bottom of the track. You see Matt Kins is working underneath him right now. So I believe he's one of the guys just waiting to the mandatory caution to start working on this thing. For more on Ryan, let's check in with Dave. Yeah, and they will make adjustments, guys, to help make that car turn better tight was the report from Ryan Newman early on in the run. And they're going to have to start the day working hard on that 12 car. And again, the reason for the competition caution was the fact that we had rain throughout much of the weekend. There was not a lot of rubber on the racetrack. And when a track is green, it's uh, almost like a cheese grater grinding off the tires. And Andy, that creates a serious problem for uh, anyone trying to run aggressively. Yeah, it is. This track's been ground with a, with a diamond grinder. So you got grooves, little grooves in here. So it's really challenging for these Goodyear tires. Well, right now, Sorensen's led every single lap, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. right behind him. They're running almost identical lap speeds. And I'll tell you what, Harvick, Kevin Harvick, oh, hard into the wall. 66 car. That is Jeff Green. He had been on and off pit road just a few minutes ago because he had brushed the wall earlier. Right, retire. 
And you heard him say a right rear tire. He it had look, actually come on the flat, pit road. Though. The right rear looks like it might be up. Yeah, it's contact with a wall. And he had actually come down pit road earlier, Andy, I guess, and uh, and they... Yeah, right now you take a look yeah, at it. Right see the right rear tire is soft. See the right rear tire is flat on it right now. So he called it correctly. He got down in the corner, lost the right rear. But you got to believe that maybe a piece of metal cut the tire down, Andy, from brushing that wall. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing that happens when you make contact with that wall. A lot of times you'll get some uh, metal hanging there that'll grab that tire, blow it out. Nothing you can do when that happens either. You can see he's just along for the ride right here. You know, his, his problem started earlier. Hit pit road with brushing the wall. Got a penalty. Went back out in the racetrack and had this problem right now. So I tell you what, this is one of the greatest racetracks in the country. Everybody puts their heart and soul in here, but it's going to end for him today. Yeah, it started out bad and then got worse. Yeah, not Jeff a good Green. day for Jeff Green there in the 66 car. Uh, two pit stops and uh, pretty heavily damaged Chevy Monte Carlo. Well, they'll line up behind the uh, pace car, and they were going to have a competition yellow at lap 15, but uh, this one uh, as a result of caution. And the teams are now being told that they may, may you put fuel in the car. And yeah, NASCAR just came on the radio and told these guys that this will be the caution, that uh, the mandatory caution they were going to have, so they can put fuel in now. Ordinarily, they don't let people come in and take fuel uh, um, until the mandatory caution, so no one can get an advantage. Well, that's the rule. The rule is when you have a competition yellow, they won't let anybody put fuel in the cars on the pit stop before that competition yellow comes out just to make it even for everybody else. Well, this can be a full-blown pit stop. These guys know the way their car's handling it. And when you got a bad handling car, you don't want it to keep going like Ryan Newman does. So they're loving this pit stop right now. Look for some big changes. And I feel like the racetrack's starting to rub up a little bit now, guys. Be better on tire wear. This next run, they ought to be able to stretch it. And uh, by the next run, I think everything will be good on tire. All right, they're going to peel off. And they should all come at 55 miles an hour down what is a lengthy pit road. It's five-eighths of a mile long, one of the longest pit roads in all of NASCAR. As they come to you, they head down toward uh, Mike Massaro. His only complaint was that the car needs to turn better. The plan is for four tires to also go up on the track bar and make an air pressure adjustment as well. Four tires and fuel for Jeff Burton. Looks like a clean pit stop. Allen. A little debate out of whether to take four or two tires to keep track position for Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s team. They're going to play it safe. Take four tires on this stop, Dave. Twenty-year-old Reed Sorensen hits his marks perfectly. They will make a track bar adjustment. That's the wrench in the rear window. His car was very loose, wanted to spin out on him. That will change the chassis. They'll also make an air pressure adjustment to these four tires. Send him back out. He came in the leader. Will he win the race off pit road? It looks like no. Tony Stewart's going to go by, guys. Damn good job. That's the way to start the day off. And you heard it exactly. What a great way to start the day off for the Home Depot bunch. They gained two spots with great pit work, and you heard them talking about all those adjustments to Reed Sorensen's car, but it cost them a couple of spots. Well, I tell you what, Stewart's has still got a good car, though. Stewart's is running great right now, but Stewart, we talked about earlier, this car was marching to the front. He picked up a lot of spots, and the guys on pit road really helped. All right. Let's take a look at the crew camera on the 41 car. Jason Sheets, who's the front tire changer. He is a native from Indianapolis, having to perform under pressure, getting those tires on. Jason Sheets getting the work done for Reed Sorensen and his Dodge. Under caution for the first time of day. Contact to the wall with the 66 car back in a moment. Visualize the air going over the cars. It's called draft tracks. Let's take a look. Right now, you see Ryan Newman busting the air right now, and you got the terminal air of Matt Kenseth behind him. Now, Matt pulls down the bottom. He's in the clean air. He has more pressure on the front of his car, what makes it turn better. But now, look at that. He's drafting up behind Newman. That's what you want. But you want to get out of that air, folks, to get more air to the front of the 17 car. So he pulled back. Now, the 12 car, Ryan Newman, is back in the draft, which is going to give him really good straightaway speed. Let's take one more time. Yellow air is pressure on the nose. The 17 car pulls down into the clean air right now, which gives him the best handling car. But the better draft in the straightaway is Ryan Newman behind him in the blue air. 
And I gotta love the fact that the air changes colors when the pressure and air speed changes in the draft tracks to let you know how the air is actually changing as it uh, becomes turbulent and then less so and changes colors behind the car. Well, Jerry, one thing you gotta remember, the blue air, when you're behind in a place like Daytona or Talladega, that's giving you really good straightaway speeds. But a place like this, you wanna get out of that in the corners. Dave, you got more? Yeah, Denny Hamlin is back on pit road, guys. Uh, he got a penalty for speeding down pit road. And because they removed a little bit too much tape from the car for the adjustment they wanted, they put a little bit of tape back on. So it could have been just a, a, a pass through, but they decided to stop and put a little tape back on the front grill. Any way you look at it, that's going to be very, very costly because he was in eighth spot before he made that stop. That's going to take him back on this restart to about 41st or 42nd. So that's, that's a big penalty. All right, let's check in down with Alan uh, on the tire situation. A.B.? Hey, just uh, finished looking at all the tires that came off the cars in my section of pit road. Only one showed any sign of cords. The leaders all looked good. So as the cars have run in the race here, it looks like that problem has taken care of itself as expected. Yeah, that's good. That's what's going to happen the more these guys run. But this sun on the track, it's going to take rubber really good. So these guys won't have to worry about this. If that first run didn't show many cords, I wouldn't be too worried about it from here on if I was a crew. A lot of the teams were real concerned about they ran all day yesterday and they could not rubber up this racetrack. But we really think the temperature, how wet it was yesterday, that's what was causing the problem. But right now, it looks good. All right, one car that is looking really good right now is Tony Stewart. Great pit work, Greg Zipadelli and company. In this first pit stop of the day, gained him a couple position, puts him back out front for the first time today. As the pace car pulls away, we will listen in to the spotters and the drivers as we go full throttle. Jr. looking in the inside uh, and stay, thinks better of it and stays in line. I tell you right now, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is giving Stewart all he can take inside for the pass right now. It looks like he's got the position getting down into turn one. Can okay, you see that? Oh, well, cars pressure. here. Cars spinning. That's the 12 car of Ryan Newman. Spins around heavy contact. Right, we're rolling. We're rolling. Head down pit road. And caution comes out for the second time of day here on lap number 20. A lot of people predict Newman that maybe the guy to win this race because he ran so good at Pocono, a track so close to Indianapolis, but he was perfect in practice. We don't know what's going wrong here. He's been really struggling with that car from the start of the race. I don't know what caused that accident right there, but he's been struggling. Yesterday in practice, that car looked really good. In the day, it just started going backwards. You know, Andy, the track started rubbering up quicker than these guys thought. Yeah, this track's changing a lot because we didn't have this kind of sun on, on the racetrack when we were practicing. Them four, I know. We'll be in the garage, bud. Yeah, these guys are going to go to the garage and do quite a bit of work to get this car back out. As i got to tell you, these soft walls on these racetracks right now are just a heaven sent. Numa's got the left side of that car tore really big time. And NASCAR and Tony George, who owns this racetrack, invented these soft walls. And these drivers are loving it right now with impacts like that. Caution flag a moment ago. The 12 car of Ryan Newman spins around. There is contact in this cloud of smoke here in the corner. See his driver side first, too. And that's kind of like we saw J.J. Yaley in practice in the 18 car hit very similar to this. And uh, boy, I tell you, that really hurts when you hit the wall like that. Nice job by Carl Edwards to make the miss here. Uh, he's up high. He's up high. He's still up high. He's still up high. He's coming down. He's coming out right on apron now. Right on apron. Come on, right, everybody. Nice job. You know, hold up. Now, Ryan Newman was very close to being uh, in the top 12 in the chase. He was in 13th spot, but just 30 points behind Dale Earnhardt Jr. And this could be a huge blow as this uh, traffic now snaking their way around some of the debris on the racetrack. Yeah, they just changed tires. They don't want to have to come back and look at all this debris everywhere. So these guys are going to be really picking their way through here. 
Wouldn't be surprised to see somebody get a flat tire out of that. Well, safety crews are on the track. Caution out for the second time today. We'll take a break and come back with a restart. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway to me is, is like the holy grail in racing uh, and always has been, always will be. I mean, there'll, there'll be nothing that'll ever take its place, but uh, to finally win at the Brickyard and, and finally accomplish a, a dream of just winning a race there was everything to me. I mean, it's been the biggest race of my career. Tony is one of our five Hoosiers in the All-State 400 at the Brickyard here today. He is also one of three who has held the lead. It was Reed Sorens in the pole setter first. Stewart then took over after a brilliant pit stop, but just relinquished it to Dale Earnhardt Jr. And now down in our pit studio with a very special guest, let's go to Susie. Well, we have a full house along with Brad and Dale. We have James <laughs> Denton from ABC's Desperate Housewives, who is the Grand Marshal. Everybody always recounts their very first time walking into this place. What was it like for you? It's unbelievable. I've been on the field for World Series and college bowl games and everything else, but being up on the flag stand when those guys come under you the first time, it just about blasted me right off of the thing. I talked to Jimmy Johnson before the race, and he said, stay up there as long as they'll let you. Just hang on and make them drag you off because it's, <laughs> it's the best place to see a race, and that was the best advice I got all day. Hey, guys, what was the, the very first time you ever walked on the grounds here like? Uh, yes, it's incredible for me. I mean, I grew up as a kid going with my dad to closed circuit TV uh, watching these races of the Indianapolis 500. And uh, the first time to come in here was just incredible. It was back when we were running the bush cars uh, over at Raceway Park. And then the first time to come in here as a driver uh, was just the, the, a very special moment. I mean, you know, hair standing up on your arms. I mean, it's just very, very special. It was kind of safe for me being a huge fan. I always watched the Indianapolis 500. I watched the Fords and the Unsers and, and those people win those races, the Andretti's. And I came here in 1994 to watch these guys run, and I walked down onto the track. And it's just awe-inspiring to be standing on those bricks and look down at the corners. It's unbelievable. It's just a phenomenal feeling. For everyone who hasn't been lucky enough to actually be live at a track, and now you have, what do you tell your friends? You know, it's it's everything it's cracked up to be. There's there's nothing like it. I've watched on TV, but once you get out there and feel it and hear it, it's 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 one of the most amazing spectacles ever. And this obviously is just a great place to see you first. You know, Dale, we talk about feeling it, hearing it, and we're watching draft track. Did you feel like when you're when you're driving that you can see the air? I don't know about seeing it, but you definitely, as a driver, need to know exactly what that air is doing for you and, and when to be able to utilize it, uh, where to use it the very best. Are you getting a good enough pull from that car to get to him before the end of the straightaway? Because if you don't, you go in there to try to make that pass, then you lose three or four car lengths. So you got to really know how to work the air, when to use it, uh, how to best use it to your advantage to get that air back on the front of your car. Who's using it best right now? Well, right now, it looks like Dale Earnhardt Jr. He's taken a lot from his dad, and he has made his way to the front. Doc, let's go back up to you. Thank you, Susie. Great to have James joining us here from Desperate Housewives. And uh, you take a look at uh, the front of this field. Dale Earnhardt Jr. leading for the first time here in five years. The last laps he led here was in 2002. Lap 23, completing caution number two. Over a quarter of a million fans here on their feet watching Earnhardt Jr. lead one of their favorite sons, the Hoosier Tony Stewart. In that pit stop a moment ago as you watch Earnhardt and Stewart flash by, the third place car of Reed Sorensen who led the first 16 laps. They made a lot of adjustments on that car on that stop. Yeah, the key thing here is he doesn't have that clean air on the nose like he did the first run. It's going to be interesting to see how his car handles behind these two guys up in front of him. You see, he got, he got, those guys got a big jump and got away from him a little bit. Folks, got to remember one thing. Aerodynamics at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is more important than anywhere else we run because the straightaways are so long and the corners are so flat. So you're going to hear us all day long talk about air on these cars. As you see right now, Matt Kent is in the back there getting away from a car to get clean air to the front of his car so he gets more downforce. Get a little bit of drafting help from the one car, Martin Truex Jr., right behind him. Now Martin Truex making the pass on Matt Kenseth. 
Truex in the one car on the inside of the 17, trying to bring Strimmy in the 40 car. That's the other Chip Ganassi car. Whoa, and uh, the 17 car, Kenseth, slides back in the spot, and uh, Strimmy has to stay on the inside. But guys, right now they got fresher tires. They're cool right now on these restarts, and they're going to get all they possibly can on these restarts while the tires are in good shape. One of the big stories early on, Jeff Gordon, who started back in 21st position, gained 11 spots in just 10 laps, and now Gordon being shown all the way up in 7th position. And we just had the caution a moment ago involving Ryan Newman in hard contact. Let's get an update from the garage area and Dave Burns. Yeah, and the update, of course, Doc, is hard work on the 12 car right now. The only difference is that Ryan has not jumped in there to help him. That's usually his uh, mode after he gets in a wreck like this. But he's just been standing at the front of the car, looking it over. Uh, really doesn't want to talk to anybody right now. And uh, as he moves around to the side of the car, uh, you can see Ryan coming to the back just to see where all the damage is. He was sitting in the garage for the longest time, very disappointed, just sort of hands on his knees, upset that his Brickyard 400 was over. As I got to tell you, Newman thought he had a really good car for this race. He's disgusted right now with himself because he lost to get into that corner. And you know what? The Brickyard 400, it's 365 days away right now till you get to come back and do it again. The 31 car. Now look at this line here. The Earnhardt car goes by the 8, then this Tony Stewart, then the Target car. But that next car in line, the AT&T Chevrolet of Jeff Burton, he sat on the pole here a year ago and had the best race car for the first 100 laps, and it went away. But he's got a really good race car here early on today. Yeah, and these guys were talking about that, and they came here with a little different strategy for practice. They, you know, they didn't really want to. They've already sat on the pole for the Brickyard 400, so they didn't really have to come here and do that. So they just constantly traded on the race they didn't want to repeat they didn't want to have a good strong first half and not be able to finish it off so these guys really practice for this and with more on uh, jeff burton let's check in with mike massar and doc speaking of jeff burton's practice i spoke with scott miller this morning and there was a little bit of frustration with practice scott told me that jeff burton really likes long runs during practice that helps him really evaluate where the car is but because of the way the tire was wearing almost down to the cords in about 10 laps they were unable to get those long runs so that was a little bit frustrating the other frustrating part, there was really no break in the middle of the practice, so they didn't have time to really digest and really break everything down. But it doesn't seem to be affecting them out there right now, guys. Well, Mike, Mike i got to tell you, that's really true because after you practice on the racetrack for about 45 minutes, you're looking forward to that break that NASCAR gives you to come in and think about it and try to make a decision what to do to the car. Yeah, it's just the driver, the driver and the crew chief need to have that time where they can just decompress a little bit and think. When you, when you're that practice is going on, things are happening so fast that the crew chief even he can't hardly think about the changes and all the things he would like to do to the car. Almost he needs that little downtime to be able to decide that. Speaking of downtime, there are two long five eighths of a mile straightaways here at Indianapolis, and Rusty in the car. Can you breathe in there? I mean, it's like it takes forever to get out of turn four right there and get all the way down to turn one. But Jerry, it feels like you can breathe in the front straightaway a little bit, but it seems like you're more relaxed in the back straightaways. You see Jimmy Johnson now making the pass on Kurt Busch perfectly getting into turn one. I tell you what, this 48 car, it's got a good car right now. It's starting to wake up. But after practice yesterday, you know, he didn't, what, he didn't know what to think because he really didn't like his car. And with more on the Jimmy Johnson, let's check in with Alan Bestwick. Who came on the radio when that uh, first caution came out, Doc, and told his crew that his car was pretty good, not bad was the phrase that he used. He said it needed just a little help with front end grip in the turn. So they made an adjustment on the pit stop to try and help him with that. You saw him just pick up the spot from Kurt Busch. Jimmy is marching forward. He took the green flag in this race back in 19th spot, and that was eighth he just picked up. And as you see, Mark Martin, the 0-1 car, making a move inside of the two car. We'll remind you that Jimmy Johnson, by the way, is without his crew chief, Chad Canals, who's been the team leader and a major force in their success. He will be gone until August 15th. So Ron Malik filling in and doing a pretty good job. Yeah, this car's handling real well. You see it, but just a little whisper of smoke. That's just a tire rubbing on the fender. One of the front tires. Tra these cars travel so much in the front end when they put on the brakes and get down in the corner that it makes the tire actually rub the fender. You know, the two car, Kurt Busch, he's starting to fall back a little bit too right now. It makes you think, does the 12 car and the two, since their teammates have close to the same setup, because he just can't seem to hold the bottom the way they need to. It looks like Kurt Busch's car is a little better than Ryan's was. Uh, Ryan's car was so bad that he was he was losing the spot or two almost every lap. At least Kurt Busch can keep up a little bit here. Mark Martin's one of the best cars in the racetrack right now. 
The story today thus far has been uh, the early success of this car, Dale Earnhardt Jr. In uh, his entire career as a driver here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the young man only led a total of 13 laps. As he comes by this time, he will equal that total in one race today. I got to tell you, Dale Earnhardt Jr. fans, this guy has been about two or three tenths of a second faster than anybody for many, many laps in a row right now, so he's looking really good. 31 laps of 160 are in the books at the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the 14th running of the All-State 400 at the Brickyard. He has now led more laps today than he has his entire career at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Tell you what, though, Dale Earnhardt Jr., they're in the next pit stop, they're going to have to work on the left front corner of the air dam. We got another camera shot on his left front air dam. He's run over a ripple strip and he's bent it under. And you can right see there. right there, guys, that's causing an aerodynamic push. He's lost about two tenths of a second. All right, let's get you up to speed on what's happening with Dale Earnhardt Jr. and some of the other leaders. First, here's Alan Bestwick. And Doc, I just talked to Tony Erie Jr., Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s crew chief, about that. He looked at me, he waved thumbs down. He said, that is going to hurt us for a while. Hopefully, we can pull that out on the next pit stop and confirm that Jr. did run over one of the rumble strips. These little, kind of like, like speed bumps they have on the bottom of the racetrack to keep drivers from dropping their left side tires into the grass. Dave? The only speed bump, so to speak, so far for Tony Stewart is a car that just doesn't want to turn like it did on the first run. He radioed in early in this run, way too tight already, just a little bit loose off the corner. They'll make adjustments on the next stop to try to help Tony's car. Behind him, Reed Sorensen now running third after starting on the pole. On the first run, Reed's car was loose. It wanted to spin out. They made air pressure, track bar adjustments. He says now, going into just one corner, turn four that is, just a little bit tight. So working the adjustments also on your pole center. Mike? After sitting on the pole and leading a bunch of laps at the beginning of last year's Brickyard 400 and then fading to finish about 15th, Jeff Burton said he'll never forget that. He came here with a little bit different approach and concentrated a little bit more on race setup during practice. It's paying off right now, although he says the car is a tick tight. Alan? Juan Pablo Montoya started on the outside of the front row. He has fallen back to the fifth position, but stabilized there after slipping back in the opening run of the race. Complaining about the front end grip of his car, Montoya wants it to cut a little better in the corners, and that's what he's working on now, getting pressure from Jeff Gordon. Mike? And Jeff Gordon charged from the 21st starting position all the way to sixth now, and he's done it all by himself. Feels like the car's extremely balanced, although he's feeling a tight condition when he gets on the throttle. Right behind him, Kevin Harvick. Harvick's had a bit of an obstacle start the race and that was because his spotter his secondary spotter had a faulty cable in his radio they had to change that out and adjust but it doesn't seem to be holding Kevin Harvick back right now running solid in the top 10 Jamie and Mark Martin started 13 making his move on up gained five positions he's currently in eighth now he came over the radio after that first pit stop and said guys I think my second gear is broken so right now he only has first third and fourth now where that will affect him is when he exits pit road and restarts they're hoping not to use that first gear because they said the team told me it eventually will go tire wear was good after that stop but right now he says that right rear feels like it's wearing just a bit alan jimmy johnson started 19th he's up to the ninth spot now the defending winner of this race just radioed his crew said the adjustment they made on the last pit stop helped him in the corners exactly where he needed it to right now the back end is sliding a little bit on that 48 car out the top 10 will be Kyle Busch in the five car for Hendrick Motorsports. He started 18th. He's moved up to 10th place, and there's trouble on the track. Tony Raines against the wall, gets tagged uh, in the door in the right front of that car. Also spinning is uh, Robbie Gordon in the car number seven. And the heavily... That was that As a nine car, got right inside of him, turned him around. And right now, this is Casey King's Dodge, uh, who got uh, a side-on impact uh, with the, the directly the nose of the car. It looks like the 96 car lost it, and they said the 9 car got in the side of the 9 car. Casey King got into side of him after he was sideways in the middle of the racetrack. So they killed both cars here. Big damage on him. Now, here's what happened up in the turn a moment ago. The 96 car. Now, watch Casey King and the 96 side-by-side. Yeah, these two guys just not quite enough room between them. Yeah. I don't really know who to put the blame on, but boy, this is a bad, this is bad for Casey Kane. These guys are trying to just get something going here and just not been able to do it this year. I tell you what, in our earlier rear play, it looks like a nine just drilled him in the door, but coming back at the replay, you can see what happened. The arrow loose kicked in and the both cars slid up in each other. 
that's just the hard problem. to race down in the corner side by side at this track. It's just real narrow getting down in there. The groove is. All right, from the Allstate onboard camera, Casey Kane comes back across and just right uh, in the right front fender. Just finishes them both off right there. They were both already torn up, but that just finished them off. Let's take one more look ang angle this right here as they get in a corner. 96 is already wrecked. He's coming across the track and boom, Kane's got nowhere to go. But before that, Casey went inside and got arrow loose and slid up in the side of the 96. It looks like Casey started this wreck. Well, this will count now as a competition yellow as a, and you will be allowed to take fuel. The damaged cars now limping down pit road will be headed back to the garage area. As you guys said, Casey Kane hoping to be able to finally get a top 10 being fairly conservative early on here after a good qualifying run. He heads to the garage and behind him, Tony Reigns. Yeah, both those cars are really destroyed. They line up behind the pace car. You heard the guys on pit road a moment ago in our sprint up to speed talking about guys who needed changes. Tony Stewart said it was too tight, would not turn. Others wanted changes. They're headed to you, Mike Massaro. And Doc, just before this pit stop, Jeff Burton came over the radio saying that he's trying to point the nose of the car in the right direction, but the car just won't turn. He's looking for some grip. They're going to make an air pressure adjustment and a four tire change on Jeff Burton, the team on the wall, and they leap into action as they work on the right side of the 31 car and go to work there. Fuel being put in and the chassis wrench being put in as well as they make their adjustment. Ellen. After they change the right side tires on this eight car, watch front tire carrier Sean Ward. After he places the left front tire in place, he's going to give a big pull on that lower fender that's been damaged on this eight car. There he is. He's trying to pull it out, but has been told not to waste any time. Get the car out of the pits. Dave. The challenge for Tony Stewart's crew, make my car turn better in the center, make that stop when it leaves the corner. They'll make a chassis and air pressure adjustment to try to help that. Here's a race off pit road and Dale Earnhardt Jr. Yeah, it? all right. And Martin Truex Jr. gaining 10 spots. Uh, Got to wonder if they just did some some tire strategy there. Yeah, it's about time that some of, one of these cars tried that because the track is rubbering in. The left side seemed to hold up real well anyway, and they hadn't been that many laps, so that was a good move for Martin Truex Jr. Third caution of the day, and everyone able to get on pit road. Here's the race off pit road. It's Earnhardt Jr. Great pit work by the 20 crew. He is second off pit road. Then comes Juan Pablo and Truex. Into our in race reporter, Dale Jr. Dale Jr., Rusty Wallace, ESPN. You got us? Sir. Buddy, your car looks like it's really fast out there, but about 10 laps ago, it looks like you injured that left front air dam, bent it under just a little bit. Are you feeling the push in that car now because of that? Not really. I mean, there was a little bit of aerotight getting in, but I think that was more race car. Tony Jr. and the guys said they got it fixed out, uh, pulled out on the pit stop air, so should be okay. We'll tune on it some more, and uh, I'll probably keep hitting it. Uh, that rubble tip down there ain't made for stock cars. We can tear my fenders up every time I come down here, but I like to get down there next to the grass, you know what I mean? All right, Dale. Thanks for talking to us. 10 more. Hey, Tony Jr., here's Andy. You got a copy? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, we see that uh, that valence there. Is that gonna? You think that's gonna hurt it? And are you gonna uh, are you gonna be able to get it pulled out and get it to stay there? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how many more times he wants to get it. But uh, you know, it's, we're gonna just uh, do the best we can and pull, keep pulling it out every stop so we can drive where he needs to. But I'll just keep tuning the car around it. I mean, uh, it, these cars are aerodependent. Sometimes you just get rid of it and just do the best you can to get it mechanically turning. Yeah, 10 4. How's the tire wear looking? Uh, it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's kind of your typical deal. You know, when you come here in the summertime and you're testing and stuff, you, you have the same issue that we had this week. So uh, once the race got started, we knew it'd be great. And uh, right now, everything looks good. Okay, Tony, thank you a lot. You guys looking good. How about, right, thanks, a, how about a little sarcasm from Tony Urich Jr.? Now, folks, Dale Earnhardt Jr. can actually hear what Tony Urich Jr. was telling us. Now, here's the pit stop where they were trying to pull that left front valence out. I tell you, that left front valence is pretty tough down there, and they pulled on it. They really didn't get much out of it, but, you know, we were watching his lap speeds, and he's about a tenth of a second off right now, and every now and then, him and Stewart run almost identical lap time, so it's not a real, real big deal, and uh, I think they'll be fine. He said it depends on how many more times he wants to hit it. Do you ever he's tell his dad, Dale Earnhardt Sr., don't hit that thing? Yeah, but he said, I'm going to hit it anyway, so you're just going to have to fix it. <laughs> and he oh. sounds just like his dad right there. Oh, uh, the <laughs> apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Now, the one car of Martin Truex Jr. was speeding on the exit of pit road and was penalized. And uh, 
when you get penalized here, that longest line is very long. Oh, that longest line is very long. So he's way in the back right now. Now here's a car that I wouldn't doubt on the next pit stop might try two right side tires for track position since his track is starting to rub up and look a little better right now. Yeah, he was fourth spot coming out of the pits. And now he's going to line up in 37. So that's a tremendous penalty at this track. Take a while to overcome that. All right, green flag waves again as Dale Earnhardt Jr. leads Tony Stewart, Juan Pablo Montoya, and, to and Jeff Gordon down to turn one. Watch him, but that's Jimmy Johnson. But the 07 now making a move. That's Clint Boyer. And you heard in the pre-race show, they made an engine change, and he had to start shotgun, which is dead last on the field. And he has done a nice job driving this car up toward the front. Looks like the engine they put in there pretty good, too, because he was passing on the straightaway right there. Looks like he cleared Jimmy Johnson right there on the backstretch. Right now, it does look like... Dale Jr. is having any problem whatsoever. I'm watching the lap times. He just ran almost two tenths of a second faster than Tony Stewart right now. So it's really not worth messing with that air dam if it's going to cost you time in the pits. I think where it'll really show up is if he happens to get back in traffic. I think it'll hurt him more than it is out front. He's got the advantage of that clean air pushing down on that nose right now. So it may not be hurting quite as much as that clean air is helping him. Well, one driver who didn't want to be where he is right now, he was hoping to have a good day, but it all went away early. Right, Dave? Yeah, that did for Casey Kane. And uh, after they got back to the garage area, you and Tony Raines had a fairly extended conversation, shared your views with each other. I'm sure you didn't come to an agreement. What actually happened? Uh, we were just, uh, he came over to talk about it. I don't, uh, my, my car was backwards as I was getting into the corner and I was running low. So, I mean, I was told he entered on my right rear corner, whether that happened or not. It, my car was backwards before I got there, so it was over. But uh, just disappointing when you're going backwards that fast. It's, uh, you know, that's what happens. I mean, if you have fast cars, you're not wrecking. If you have slow cars, things happen. And just help me clarify, you were crashing or it was just way loose? I was tight. The car wouldn't turn the whole time. That's why I was going backwards. And then it went way loose into that corner. And I think it's because he sucked up on my right rear, but that's just what I was told by my team or whatever. So I don't know. I'm not sure what happened. I was looking forward. Next thing I knew, I was in the wall. All right, big trouble on the racetrack, guys. Big crash here. Jimmy Johnson involved. The 48 car spins around. And uh, the last year's winner involved. Uh, flat. I don't think I have too much damage. He's got a little more damage than he knows. That left front uh, fender's tore up pretty bad. And here's Ricky Rudd with the right front fender blown off of his car. The 88 car involved. Jamie here's McMurray, the... big damage, too. Both the front and rear of the 26 car. McMurray's, he tries to get on the pit road. We're going to have to go to the garage, guys. This track is so narrow, when something happens up there, it's hard to avoid it. I tell you, there's debris all over the racetrack, too, when that accident happened. And these guys are running over this stuff, blowing tires and tearing up. And like you said, Andy, it's not like a regular track. It's narrow. Jimmy McMurray looks like he get back on the track, but after a pit stop or two. Now, Jimmy Johnson's car, they're going to work on that. And I think they can get it back and stay working throughout the rest of the race. The 10 car involved, that's Scott Riggs, as he gets turned from behind the 21 car. That's Bill Elliott. They were all stacked up almost in a uh, almost in single like file. A, almost like a domino effect here. All these guys are running so close together. Almost three wide coming off the corner. Just not enough room. All take, of them so close, that's why they all get in the red. I want to take another JJ look at Yale, three. There's up another car. Trying to back it way down middle of one and two. Big, big, big wreck. Big Ray, back it down, wave them off. They're still checked up around here. Just pick your way through there. Take the time, pick your way through there. A lot of debris. Clear high right there. Clear high all the way to the racetrack. Come on through there. Boy, well, Elliot Sandler's uh, spotter being able to weave him and talk him through all that debris on the racetrack. We're going to take one more look at this replay here shortly. Getting into turn three, and we'll see what happens to this again. See 48 car trying to make it to pit road right now. Got the left front. He's trying not to tear the fender off, Andy. A chain reaction crash involving five cars. We'll update who the cars are, how much damage, and what happened to last year's winner here as he tries to make it on the pit road back in a moment.
action. This one, a big one. Eight cars in total. And we're back here in the pit studio. Brad Darty and Dale Jarrett, who's won this race two times. What goes through your mind when you see a wreck like this? Well, I think when it happens right in front of you, there's not a lot of room to get away from the other cars. You just kind of get sucked into it. I think one thing that's one of the things that's creating these problems are these guys are on colder tires, uh, the air pressure down, and they're having to start these cars so loose. And it looked like the 26 car just got loose on the inside. We talk about how aero dependent these cars are. You need that air. And when they get it taken away from you and you've got a loose car anyway, then it creates a big problem like this. Yeah, the thing that was impressive to me that uh, you talk about, look how narrow that is. And it's almost like they get stacked up when that one car gets loose and they're on top of one another. I think patience also would be a great virtue at this point in time. Like I said, they're very, very loose. They need to take their time, feel their way back into the race and let the th race come to them. Looks like these guys are running all over each other. Well, let's check in with Dave. And Jamie McMurray's crew is working on the car right now. Uh, look to us like an air off the car situation, Jamie. Is that what it felt like? Well, I mean, it was just uh, put yourself in a bad situation. The, the Matt was passing the 48 car, and, you know, it's tempting when you're the third guy in line to want to make it three wide. But uh, I, I don't know why the 11 did what he did, but he stuck it underneath Matt. And, you know, and I mean, my perspective looking at that, I thought, well, he's got to let Matt go because he's not far enough in there. And it didn't look like he did, and Matt had to go straight. And, you know, the... the when you when you watch on TV, you don't realize how much you're sliding around, and you're already kind of out of control. And when you expect everyone to keep going at the, the pace they are, and they don't, when you try to slow down, you just can't. I mean, you lose it. And uh, you know, I tried to catch it, and then it hooked, and I thought I was going to hit head on. You're just you're just trying to save it. So just, just I put myself in a bad situation there. Is it doubly frustrating when you've been doing so well, 15th in points now, Jamie? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really even pay attention to the chase deal. If you, if you run well, you, you make the chase. If you don't, you don't make the chase. But, um, you know, Chicago, we struggle a little bit. Um, but we had a pretty good car today. It's just track position is very important, and uh, they made some pretty big adjustments on our car and, and got it better and better. So, um, I felt pretty good right there. But you know, just go fix it and ride around now. Okay, glad you're okay. They are going to fix it, as he said. He is going to get back out on the track for some points, Jerry. But it's not the way you want to end the Brickyard 400. Thank you, Dave. For more information on track hazardous, log on to ESPN.com. Search word safety. Work on going down there. And Andy, you've been where these guys are many, many times trying to repair cars in a hurry. And uh, where, how do you know where to start? Well, you just start assessing what it's going to take to get the car to go. First, get it on the ground where it'll roll. And then the wheels will all go in the same direction. And then make sure things aren't going to fall off of it. Uh, but this is just not where you want to be in the Brickyard. You know, big race here at the Brickyard. You sit in the garage area. That is not where you want to be. There were eight cars involved in this fourth caution flag of the day. You see Jamie McMurray's car uh, work ongoing out on pit road. The list, Robbie Gordon, Scott Riggs, J.J. Yaley, Bill Elliott. You mentioned McMurray, Jimmy Johnson, pretty heavy damage. Ricky Rudd, Carl Edwards almost got through it at the back of that pack. Remember, Edwards is driving with an injured thumb from last weekend in a short track incident. And he got tagged late. His car spun around. Minimal damage, but eight cars involved. And an incident on the racetrack that brought out the caution flag for the fourth time today. Back with a restart in just a moment. Nice race, Casey. See you later. Bobby Gordon and Carl Edwards, those cars involved. McMurray back being repaired. Last year's winner, by the way, Jimmy Johnson, has been repaired. It's been on and off and on and off and now back on pit road. These guys have done a great job fixing this fender. They had, a, they had some pretty good damage here. They came in here and worked on it. And Jimmy was smart enough to get it in the pits and not tear it, you know, blow the tire out and tear up the fender even worse. So uh, it's pretty impressive how good these guys have done here. As you watch the repairs, let's check in his pits with Alan. And, Doc, this is the fourth pit stop under this caution flag. Right after he finished spinning and Jimmy grabbed a gear and got it pointed in the right direction, he came on the radio and said, I don't think we've been damaged too badly. They've spent a lot of time working on that left front fender. So critical to keep that car glued to the racetrack in the corners. They're putting these patches on to try and cover the holes that have been poked in that fender after restoring the shape as best they could to it. He leaves pit road carefully at 55 miles an hour. He is being shown now one lap down in 35th position. But remember, we do have the lucky dog, so he could get that lap back. One thing I see here is they've got that left front fender shape really, really good. I think that's even going to be better than it was when he started the race. This could even be an advantage for him right now, even though he is a lap down. 
They are holding the one car that is Martin Truex Jr. A single lap rusty for quote running the paddle. Well, you get right down to end of pit road. You're going for it. You're almost getting ready to get passed by the lap car. So if you go for it, and he just didn't make it that time. So now he's going to have to go for the lucky dog to get back in the ball game here. The paddle is the stop sign. The official holds at the end of pit road, saying stop, 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 and he didn't stop. So they held him until he, the pace car and the leaders came by. For you, Jimmy Johnson fans, a year ago, Johnson was back as far as 40th early in this race, and he went on to win it. So, Jimmy, who is awfully good here, and Andy, you mentioned that fender isn't going to hurt him at all. If anything, it might help him. Yeah, he's not out of it by any means, but he's going to have a race on his hands. He's got Martin Truex Jr. that's a lap down, Ricky Rudd. He's, all these guys are going to be fighting for this lucky dog. Green flag waves once again. Earnhardt Jr. takes them down in a turn one. Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon, and Juan Pablo Montoya. See the one car fighting these guys trying to get this lap back. Jimmy Johnson wasn't able to line up on the inside of that front row because he pitted without the pit road being open. So they make him start at the tail end of the longest line. Look up in the middle of that straightaway, the 22 car, the Caterpillar car. That is a Toyota Camry. And Toyota got its very first win in NASCAR Bush Series competition last night at a Raleigh Raceway Park. Jason Leffler, first win for Toyota in the 22nd race they were in. Could Toyota be a factor today, guys? Well, it definitely could. Toyota's got a strong engine package, and Bill Davis racing with that 22 car. They're really starting to get their act together, and it looks real good. And the only problem is they only they don't have many numbers of cars in the race, so their chances are not as good as they would be if they had about three or four more of those cars in the race. Here's Jeff Gordon making a pass on Martin Truex, the lap car. Take a look and at Tony Stewart right underneath Dale Jr. right now. Got him loose. Jr.'s up the racetrack, and Stewart's underneath. And he should have the track position get down into turn three, and he does. Now, you said he got him loose. There was no contact. Was this all arrow loose we're talking about? Sure, it was all arrow loose. You saw Tony Stewart get up behind the eight car of Dale Earnhardt Jr. He wiggled a little bit. He went up the racetrack. Dale did. He shot underneath him. That's a classic case of arrow loose. And you can manage that. Crash. Another crash on the racetrack. Four cars involved. Scott Riggs tries to avoid it. 25 of Casey Mears involved. The National Guard Chevrolet, another one of the Rick Henry cars. Another one of Ray Evernham's cars involved here, too. This is just a real disappointing for him. I know the 19, Elliott Sadler is involved in this. So caution flies on lap 54. Here is uh, Johnny Sauter in the 70. I have a jet car down there, huh? Tell you what, they've took out a lot of cars right now. And talk about Everham a little bit. His two cars brought back last year's nose selection to try to get these teams back on track. And it appeared like it was working a little bit, but right now they're really not going to know because they don't have anything to bring back home. You're looking at last year's Charger nose in that 19 car. Let's take a look at this replay. Looks almost the same as the last time, last wreck we saw. These two cars just getting together. It's not enough room for these other guys. Guys, we talked earlier in our broadcast about you need to get single file down into turn one and into turn three, and they're not completing these passes as they get in a corner. And you can see the 25 car of Casey Mears gets arrow loose and gets up into the side of Johnny Sauter. Just so hard to pass getting in the corner at this racetrack. You really have to start that pass off the corner and try to clear them on the straightaway. Now from the onboard camera for Elliott Sandler, the All-State onboard, let's listen. Clear, clear, all clear by two. Pick it up up here. Come on, on the low side. Come on, on the low side. Get going when you can, man. Get going when you can. Get going when you can. 45 ran over us right there. Guys, from a driver's perspective, perspective getting down into turn three, when you see him wrecking in front of you, you're just to change reactions. Take a look at this. They're wrecking in front of you. He just tries to slow up. The 19 car does, and he just can't. Gets high in the racetrack. Elliott Sadler does, and that wreck happens. But it's all about Arrow Loose getting in the corner. We might mention that the 45 car, Kyle Petty, also involved in this incident. As you see, the damage repair on Elliott Sadler. But early on here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, it's been all Budweiser Chevrolet. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has led twice for 33 laps. Back in just a moment. Ah, 
hate Jeff. Its last win came in 1999. Bobby Labonte. He caught our buddy Rusty down the stretch. Jeff Gordon again 2001 winning the Brickyard 400 and the championship. So keep in mind that six of our last nine winners here including Jimmy Johnson a year ago have gone on to win the cup championship and uh, Susie it's not true that they are honoring the all-state adjusters here at Indianapolis <laughs> uh, but it just certainly seems that way yeah I'm wondering who's going to survive to be the next champ five cautions five lead changes will get you caught up with the McDonald's race rundown start of the day belonged to Ganassi Sabatis who owned the first road 21 year old Reed Sorensen on the pole. Reed did a great job. He let him down the first corner, led the first lap. I know it's an outstanding moment for him, and he did a good job of taking the field around the track. Now, Dale Earnhardt Jr. had only led 13 laps here before today, but he's turned out 33. Yeah, his car looks very, very good. Even though they've got a little damage on the left front air dam, uh, I think he's still going to be a factor when it comes down to lap 160. Now, lap 38, big wreck off turn one. Tony Reigns and Casey Kane got tangled up. Yeah, it looks like Casey just went down the corner and got a little arrow loose. Uh, Tony Reigns was on outside they couldn't avoid their accident they both got together and wiped each other out even bigger wreck on lap 45 Jimmy Johnson involved in this one and this one had huge implications for the chase for the next Dell Cup Ryan Newman in 13 30 points behind Dale Jr. he got knocked out Jimmy McMurray in 15th he got knocked out Carl Edwards who's fifth yeah, there's a lot of things happening, and, and these guys are running so yeah. close. You just don't know exactly what's going to happen. You have to keep your eyes open all the time. Also, rough day for Team Everhand. All three cars knocked out. And we'll be back, hopefully looking forward to green flag racing when we come back in Indianapolis. Keep on. Show you the cars, and there is Dale Earnhardt Jr. Earnhardt Jr. has led twice for 33 laps. Jeff Gordon coming from the back of the pack didn't qualify well but passed 10 cars in just 11 laps and one of the guys we talked about at the beginning of the day one Pablo Montoya the rookie who started on the outside of the front row and wanted here as a rookie in the Indy 500 back in 2000 and Mark Martin in the 0-1 car has had some troubles here today. Tell you what, Mark Martin has had some troubles, a little bit complaining about a gearbox, but I tell you what, his car has been handling pretty good. He's worked himself all the way up in the fifth position right now, and he told us before this race, he's like, I got a good car, guys, so wouldn't surprise me if he's got a shot to win this race, Jerry. Chevrolet Corvette pace car pulls off, and a couple of Chevrolet Monte Carlos up front. Tony Stewart with Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Jeff Gordon, the top three. Great camera shot. Those cars flashed by at 180 miles an hour, just inches from the grass. As Tony Stewart's car, early on he was complaining the car would not turn. They've adjusted and adjusted and adjusted, and he went sailing by. Dale Earnhardt Jr. for the second spot. Now we've got some smoke trailing off the damaged left front fender of the 48 car of Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, they're going to have to take a look at that right now. It might, there might be the air dam and it's going to grind itself off, or it could be a left front tire rubbing the fender. And if that's the case, you're going to have to hit pit road again. It's not enough. Looks like not enough bracing in that left front fender. It's, the air's pushed it back against the tire. We can see it looked pretty good when he was in the pits, and it's all that stuff that uh, bear bond they put on is blown off. And they don't have enough support. That thing's blowing in against the tire. They're going to have to work on it some more. Well, Andy, as we're saying, it looks like the smoke is starting to stop now in the 48 car. It might have rubbed itself enough clearance. But he's got the bottom of the left front air dam kicked out pretty good, which gives you a lot of downforce. But a little farther up, it's in, which loses downforce. So it might balance itself out. As long as it doesn't blow this tire out, it'll be okay until they can get in there and work on it a little bit more. Well, we, like a true, yeah, true. we don't see any smoke right now. So why do we do it now? And now we see some smoke. So he, he may have to get this looked at. Side by side, and we see some parts and pieces coming yeah. off there. And obviously, we just cut a tire and hit the wall pretty hard. And you just say that as long as it doesn't blow this tire out, he might have a shot. But no, he just cut right into it and just slammed across the wall. And the you points. Okay, Jimmy? Yeah, this, this is a hard lick for Jimmy. He had a hard lick two weeks ago at Chicago. He jumps right out. That's a good sign. Jimmy Johnson, seventh in the point standings. He is the reigning NASCAR Nextel Cup champion. He gets out of the car, but the car is ablaze here, and here come the safety crew. Yeah, it's a really smart decision on Jimmy Johnson. He knew the car was on fire. He jumped out. 
But guys, this is the problem you have when the pitch crew doesn't fix the car the way it needs to be fixed. You know, they did the best job they possibly could. You take a look at his wife. She's calm. She knows her husband's out of the car. That's something as a wife that's got to be killing you. You're, you're really concerned. But Jimmy looks good right now. He took a big hit in the points, but I'm sure he's still going to be in the top 12, even though he's had this wreck. And he's okay. I'm not sure that his wife, Chandra, is okay because she has to sit and watch this and, and hear the reports on the radio when they ask him, are you okay, are you okay? What they didn't realize was he was already out of the car and couldn't respond to them on the radio. Now watch the middle of the screen coming down the back straightaway, the 48 of Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, we didn't see any smoke until we got to the end of the straightaway. It just instantly cuts this tire. You see it blow out and all the pieces of rubber start flying everywhere. No control of this. He just has to lock it down and ride it to the fence. Well, folks, let me tell you the bad part about this. That tire blew out at the highest part of speed at the racetrack, close to 207 miles per hour. He blows that left front off, head on in the wall, and you it's see him just... Putting a, winning that down while he was still wrecking right there. It's up against the wall. Oh, it, oh that's a hard hit. Again, Thank gosh for the soft wall, Jerry. This is, we've had three bad wrecks. Ryan Newman, J.J. Yelly in practice, and now Jimmy Johnson this hard. And yes, you had any said. You saw the window net come down. Good indication he's okay. The Safer Barriers debuted here in 2002. They updated him in 2005. Onboard camera from Jeff Burton looking up. Oh, my heavens. He says, when you're all a driver. Clear, all clear. When you're a driver, you see down, that happen in front down. of you, and it, you got to just curl up in the seat. Uh, Jerry, you really feel bad for somebody when he hit that hard, because like I said again, I'm going to tell you one more time, he has been making pit stops right now, hard hit over 200 when he crashed. Let's go down to Mike Massaro. And Jeff Gordon and Jeff Mandarin taking their cues from the 20 car. The call was to do exactly what Tony Stewart does, then, and so they come down pit road. Gordon saying the car's pretty good until he starts wearing that right rear tire, and that's when it starts to get a little bit tight. A four-tire change for Jeff Gordon. Alan, you see Dale Jr. in the center of the picture. Just two left side tires to call by Gucci Tony Lee Jr. Dave? Right sides, right sides. That was a call from Greg Zipadelli. They hated to give up any track position, but when everybody else pitted, they realized then their option was to put on four or two. They had to take two to keep with everybody else. It looks like they only got beat out by one car. On Pablo Montoya gains three spots. You see the others as the race off pit road. And fuel only for the 42 of Montoya, the three spots. i got to ask you, Andy, what about two left side tires on the eight car for Earnhardt Jr.? I think they may want to work on that left front fender, and uh, taking two tires was the call. And, and it may even change the handle of their car to be what they want it to be. They may want to change it by just putting left side tires on. Well, we talked earlier, if these guys got enough confidence in the track right now that it's rubbering up and not hurting the tires, I'm telling you guys, I've been here many times, two tires isn't a bad deal. Great pit work here in the 42 crew as they took fuel only, but they made an adjustment. Yeah, they put that in the track bar. That's a track bar adjusting tool they have. That hole in the window, they take that thing and turn it one round, raise that track bar up about an eighth of an inch. So under caution for the sixth time a day, Juan Pablo Montoya having great pit work. Last time he was here, he dominated the day back in 2000 in the Indianapolis 500, driving for Chip Ganassi. Let's show you again what happened to last year's Brickyard 400 winner. The All-State 400 winner, Jimmy Johnson, had damage on the left front fender early on in an incident, and then this happened up in the turn. The car is just tearing itself apart right now. Left front fender exploded. Tim Brewer, what do you got down there, buddy? Tell you what, Rusty, we can show you where the fuel pump's located on our... Uh... Richard Childers Chevrolet engine right here. It's mounted on the right front corner. And what we're thinking happened there is when he hit the wall, it folded the frame rail up. It broke the fuel pump off. And that's probably what ignited the fire. But there again, when you look back, there was some oil lines there also. Looked like black fire. You got a better view than I do, Rusty. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what, it, yeah, I think you're definitely right, Tim. That's a perfect explanation. He hit so hard, it had to bend that frame rail and tear it up. But you know, I believe though, these guys might be one running one of the mechanical fuel pumps, Randy. Now, if he, if he is running that, the fire came from somewhere else. Yeah, these Hendrick guys do run that cable-driven fuel pump in the trunk, so this could have very easily been an oil fire, and we see it was a big and very intense fire because it burnt the whole back of the car up. All right, for more, for more information on the parts and pieces that make these race cars, log on to ESPN.com, search word Tech Center. 
Got a great chance to see what happens when something breaks. Tim Brewer down in our ESPN Dish Tech Center. And this is what happened to the reigning NASCAR Nextel Cup champion, Jimmy Johnson, scurrying out. He's okay, but the car is not so good. To you. Special place to drive in the facility, and just uh, it just feels like that's sort of what racing is all about the history of that speedway. All the history and tradition of a great racetrack. Under caution here, Jimmy Johnson, by the way, treated and released at the Care Center. Let's visit now with our in race reporter, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Dale Jr., Rusty Wallace, ESPN, you got us? Yeah. Man, it looks like you had a car that was not handled to your liking that time. You made some changes. You, you feel pretty good about those changes now? I ain't got to try them out yet. Uh, we kind of went in one direction. It wasn't working out or we got a little too loose. We're trying to turn the car a little bit, but we got a little too loose there. And we made uh, adjustments kind of more back toward where we were leading. But obviously, if we run a few laps since then, the track might have tightened up some. I'm a little worried about that. But we should be OK. We're in traffic. Going to be uh, in dirty air. Try to do what we can to get around some of these guys and get some clean air. All right, dude, you're looking great out there, man. We'll talk to you later. Hey, Tony Jr., Andy up here in the booth. You got a copy? Got you, Andy. Hey, Tony, you got those left sides off. You really didn't get a buildup on the right sides to, be t to tell how your car's going there, but did you? can you get any indication from taking those left sides off of how your car's handling? Well, I mean, I uh, just go off the junior feel. I mean, basically, I mean, the tires, the left side tires, I put an adjustment in them in both left there that he really didn't like, so... Uh, you know, we're in a situation where you ain't got many laps on your tires, so you just uh, basically, you're playing a fuel mileage game here, so you don't have to stop two more times. So I went ahead and took the, took the advantage, just put the left on, get that adjustment out, maybe the car will go back to life like it was earlier. Okay, Tony, thanks for talking to us. Again, uh, Jamie Johnson bringing out the yellow flag has been in and out of the care center. In fact, he's uh, Jamie Little just caught up with him. Jamie? Well, the good news, he's been released and he looks to be okay. Jimmy, how are you feeling? I'm okay. The impact wasn't too bad. Uh, the flames kind of had me nervous here inside the car and I lost some eyelashes and the side of my face got pretty hot in the process. I can see your eyelashes are actually singed. Yeah, yeah. That's the first time I've had flames inside the car and that's kind of, you know, at that point you just want to get the car stopped and I'm considering turning the belts loose, but I've got cars flying by me on both sides and finally I got into the grass without anybody getting into me and I keep out of the car. Did you have indication that that was eventually going to happen with that tire rub? Uh, the tire rub, we came in and tried fixing it and I think the brace that we put on came off going down the back straight away. I heard something um, go underneath the car and, and and I could smell some tire smoke or some, you know, real quick and then boom, the tire was down and, and then the wall went. All right, guys. Jimmy Johnson, good news is he's okay. Bad news, he will not be defending his Brickyard 400 title, guys. Jamie, a day that Jimmy Johnson will not want to remember. Last year was one he would always want to remember. Involved in an eight-car melee early on, trying to weave his way through. Got some damage on the car. They came in and tried to pound that left front fender out. Did a good job of getting it buckled out, but it wasn't quite good enough because it rubbed the tire. And the next thing you know, boom, into the wall. Heavy, heavy contact. Flames are up. Jimmy Johnson is out and okay, but the car is pretty used up. Jimmy Johnson, the first 12 events of the year, well, couldn't ask for much better. Four wins, eight top fives, but the uh, seven races since, they have struggled. And you see where he is in the point standing, seventh coming in here, and this finish here today will not help him at all as we move toward the chase. Getting set for the green flag here. Great aerial coverage from high above this massive facility, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, brought to you by our good friends at Goodyear, helping NASCAR drivers get to the finish line for the past 25 years. Many drivers were on and off pit road. Some of those who did not pit included our current leader, Kyle Busch, in the five car. And of course, behind and him, Brian Vickers, in the uh, 83 car, did not pit. There's Matt Kenseth in the 17 car, the same car he finished second with the year a year ago. Martin Truex, who had that penalty earlier, had to go to the back of the pack and has now driven all the way up toward the front five. Scott Riggs, who's dodged a couple of near misses, involved in a short little shunt with some mild sheet metal damage, finds himself in fifth spot overall. There's Juan Pablo Montoya, back in sixth. The 88 car of Ricky Rudd on the inside, Rudd a former All-State 400 winner. 
Ace car will pull away. Kyle Busch stayed on the racetrack, as did the Toyota of Vickers. Vickers wants to be the first Toyota to leave at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The question is, does he have enough umph to get by the five car as they head to green? you got to do it to keep from getting arrow loose. He gets in front of Brian Vickers and starts to stretch it out now. Three wide going down the back straightaway to 31 of Jeff Burton on the inside. Burton makes it work, slides up, well, almost slides up in front of Dale Earnhardt Jr., but he's now on the inside of the 20 car. Tell you what, guys, that was a three veterans going into turn three, and that's the reason that worked. Those guys were smart. They understood how the air works, and they played it to their advantage. And guess who's coming? Kevin Harvick on the left side of your screen. Got a big picture of Elvis on the hood of that Chevrolet. Tell you what, don't count this 29 car of Kevin Harvick out right now. I'll tell you what, we haven't talked about him much. We're only 68 laps in this 168 lap race, 160 lap race. And what about that 07 car? He's back in the game right now. That engine he had to replace is probably one of the strongest in Richard Childress racing right now, Andy. Childress is awful strong, happy with his engines. Let's check in with Alan Bessler. Actually, this is a nice recovery for Clint Boyer because back on the caution at lap 51, NASCAR made him pit to fix a piece of metal that had come loose on the car that another competitor was complaining about. They had not planned on pitting that caution. Well, then when everybody else pitted, they decided to take advantage with a little strategy, try and get some of their track position back. Oh, and he's been able to miss all the wrecks, too. Boy, Jeff Gordon, the near miss there a moment ago, just trying to get to the inside. Almost had some sheet metal contacts with Denny Hamlin as his Carl Edwards, who was involved in an incident early on and uh, got just a little bit of damage on the front of the car. Jerry, that 99 car's got a little bit of damage in a right front headlight door. That's about it. And I don't believe that's going to cause much problem, but, you know, we can't count him out either, he was in, even though he was in that wreck. A moment ago, Jeff Gordon, the four-time winner here, a close call with Denny Hamlet. A lot of these guys are stacking up right there, and you see Denny Hamlin was just basically trying to protect his spot and keep Jeff from passing him, and Jeff does get by him, but then Denny passes him back, and now he's passing Ricky Rudd, another lap car, and that 11 car has had a strong horse really from the start of the race, but he had to, he got that penalty early and had to make up a lot of ground. For now with, with more on Denny Hamlin, let's check in with Dave. Yep, now it's trying to work his way back up through the field, and he's been working well, even though this is only his second year here all weekend long. He's been improving. Mike Ford said last year from the test on through the race, we improved a little bit each time Denny got on the track. He said same trend this weekend. That's what Denny's been doing, and so our mode has been don't panic. Denny will get there, and we'll get the car there to match him as now he goes by Earnhardt Jr. Well, Hamlin, we know he's getting better, thanks, Dave, but what about the eight car, Earnhardt Jr.? He's definitely fading right here, and I think they may be kind of reconsidering this left side tire change because it may have uh, upset their handling just a little bit, something they probably didn't expect, but it's de he's definitely going the wrong way. Well, Andy, I tell you what, I, I really firmly believe that the left front fender is causing some type of problem with this car. I, they probably need to really address this. You can't afford to give up any downforce on the front end here at Indianapolis. And it's, that's given some time up. They got to get this fixed. And one thing I heard them talking about, they said they got too loose. And this track is going to be tightening up the whole way here. And maybe they made that adjustment to tighten the car back up right as the track could have been tightening up. And so it could have been the wrong adjustment at the wrong time. That's right. There's two ways to look at this. If they have the left front corner of their car coming up, that can pull the wedge out of the car and make it loose also. Two problems can happen. He can lose the front and make it loose. Not just one thing happens, folks. Two things can happen here. Earnhardt Jr. takes the 11 spot away. As we move back up toward the front, Matt Kenseth in the 17, Juan Pablo Montoya in the 42. You got to take a look at 
Juan Montoya, guys. This guy has been strong. His Felix about his Chip Ganassi car has been strong from the start of this race. And here's a guy that qualified well, but I really didn't expect to race real well because he's never on a stock car here before. I talked to him last night in the motor coach lot, and I, just the look in his eye is telling me how much he wants to win this race. He's not real loud about it. He's real quiet about it, but he really wants to win this race. 72 of 160 laps. We are just eight laps away from the halfway point, and for the first time today, a 22-year-old from Las Vegas. Sprint Speed Million Sweepstakes presented by Motorola at Sprint.com forward slash speed. Vitamin water, it works for Casey Kane, and rugged and reliable Panasonic Toughbook laptops. Well, guess what? We are under yellow for the seventh time today here on lap number 75, debris on the racetrack at the entrance to pit road and that will uh, have these guys here rick monroe waving the yellow flag the nascar flagman there for the seventh time this afternoon this is a huge break for the five car kyle bush they didn't pit under that last caution and they would kind of miscalculated their fuel a little uh, window a little bit so they were going to have to pit within about two or three laps and so this is a huge break for them as a crew chief, caution. how can you take that kind of gamble? A caution was out on lap 62. You know you could make it to 75, 78. I guess, are you thinking about how many yellows we've had and that maybe yellows breed yellows? <laughs> well, I'm thinking that this, the track position is so valuable that you're going to try to roll the dice a little bit to get it. But that was rolling, rolling the dice pretty heavy there because it wasn't giving them enough window of green flag racing. But it's a big track. They can maybe get in and get, get out without losing a lap. Well, let's check in his pits with Allen. Well, the real quick answer to that question, Doc, is they weren't gambling. They miscalculated. You know that whole forget <laughs> to carry the one thing? They miscalculated when they did the number on what lap they would have to stop. It's a simple math mistake that got them in that box that this caution is helping get them out of. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, huh, guys? Yeah, I was up here kept with my calculator when everybody stayed out. Those, those few cars stayed out. And I was thinking, well, they're, they're going to have to pit here by lap 78, maybe lap 80. And uh, I was wondering if my calculation was right, but I guess it was. I got to believe right now this track is rubbering up enough that we're going to see some more two tire changes, right side changes, because I think these guys are learning now that this track position is everything in the world. Well, pit road uh, could be very lonely for the five car. I don't know how many of them will come on the pit road. We definitely know that Kyle Bush has to get there. Uh, we mentioned uh, he did not pit. Neither did uh, Brian Vickers a moment ago in the 83 car, the Toyota. But here comes the five car. 31 yeah. pulls back out. So does Harvick. And uh, others decide to come on the pit road. We've seen these guys do that on in a Bush race that we did one time in fake Kyle Bush. Same cars involved. It was it was uh, Jeff Burton and Kevin Harvick. Let's go down to Allen. And so Kyle Busch going to try and take advantage of that lucky break when they had the miscalculation. The caution going to bail him back out of it. It'll be a four-tire change. See the wrench in the right rear side. Going to try and make a track bar adjustment to help him with the handling of the car. The front end grip is what's lacking on this five machine. By the way, they're also starting to do their mouth calculations from here to the finish on fuel to see how far they can go and if they can do it on one more stop. All right, great pit work down there. Thanks a lot, Alan Bestwick, uh, covering... Uh the pit stop and you can get it. Whoa, some contact on pit road. A couple of cars coming out. Uh, the 07 and the two car uh, nearly had uh, door to door contact exiting the pits. Jerry, this is one of the narrowest pit roads. Oh my gosh, look at the back, whole back end of the two car. Now, Andy, I remember Charlotte a couple years ago when Jeff Gordon lost his rear bumper. His car actually ran faster. This isn't a bad thing, I don't think. Yeah, I knew where you were going with this. This could be actually be an aerodynamic advantage to lose that back, that tail panel. But I'm sure he didn't. He didn't want to lose it this way. Thanks, NASCAR. Appreciate it. We look really good right now. Here's Clint Boyer leaving the two car coming in, and he he got from the front end from the back. Got a sandwich from the Scott, 33. Scott Wimmer got the worst of this. You can see his right front tires aimed the wrong way. He got into that concrete wall trying to avoid this. And looks like he got the worst of this. Yeah, he's got the front of his car. Just watch this, Andy. Oh, I'm telling oh. you what, that is a hard hit. That's a hard hit. That's been some tie rods and some of the front suspension. They'll have to work on that. Jerry, when you saw that right front tire go up in the wall and stop, and when a tire stops and that car is still going forward, you know it's tweaked a lot of the suspension, bent a lot of the components. So something that small that he had no idea was going to happen could put him out of this race. 
And Kyle Busch's crew talking to uh, the NASCAR officials about uh, NASCAR has an official in every single pit there to let you know what's happening if you're doing everything right or more importantly if you do something wrong. They try to tell you not to make a mistake if you're over the line, I guess, Andy, to understand what's going on. On the 24 car of Jeff Gordon has been racing with the 11 car of Denny Hamlin. You know, air is such an important part of what you do on racetracks like Indianapolis Motor Speed. Well, air can help you or hurt you when it comes time to make a pass. Guys, let's take a look at our draft tracks. Right now, you take a look at the Jeff Gordon in the front. You see Denny Hamill in the blue air. That's the dirty air. Now he gets down underneath him in the clean air, and he gets more pressure to his nose. The front end turns better, and he makes the pass. I've been hearing these guys talking about running in this dirty air, and this is a good illustration of that. You can see how this turbulent this area is coming off these two cars and how J Denny Hamlin's seeking that clean air down on the bottom. Now, you take a look at Carl Edwards in the back. He's in the draft right now behind Jeff Gordon in that blue air. That's going to give him straightaway speed, but that's going to hurt his cornering capability. So, good illustration on a draft track there. The 11 car, Denny Hamlin. Hey, well, there's a guy that started in the back of the pack, had all these problems. He's worked his way back up to 15th. He's been as high as about 10th position. And through this series of pit stops, he's been working on the car. He's back in 15th right now. But, Jerry, there was one time when he was about 39th through a penalty he got earlier. So he's looking pretty good. He's back in the hunt now. Well, with uh, Tony Stewart leading this race and Juan Pablo Montoya second, let's uh, take a look at our uh, at and Crew Chief Challenge. And which former Indy 500 starter has the best chance to win today? If you want to cast a vote, you can text crew to 191 from your AT&T wireless phone. Standard text message rates will apply. Can I pick one? I'm going to pick C. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pick C. That's my guess right there. <laughs> I'm sure all four of them will get some votes. Montoya's, but Montoya's running second, though. He could be getting it. You know, it looks like Stewart's first, Montoya's second. Hey, what are you going to pick, B or C, Jerry? I don't know. I got, I got to hold my vote. I'm withholding okay. my vote. I'm, uh, all right, no problem. I'll text in in a moment here. We are two laps away from the halfway point, folks. We're almost halfway home. We've had a rash of yellow fever, seven yellow flags. We want to get some green flag racing in and see what's going to happen up front. Stewart has won this race before. Montoya has won the Indy 500 before. Behind them, Matt Kenseth, who has finished second here twice. They're going to come down and jump in that throttle and take the green flag. Jeff Burton wasting no time to make a move. That's the orange car top of your screen. And behind him or on the inside of him is his teammate, Kevin Hart. You see Jeff Burton, he just went and pulled down too hard on, on Harvick right there. He knew his team weight was under his left rear quarter panel. Didn't want to get tagged to get loose. But now they've got themselves back in line now. And take a look at the one car. Remember, he was held a lap earlier for not... Uh, not identifying the stop paddle at the end of pit road. He lost a lap, got the free pass, and now he is back in it, Jamie. What an up and down topsy-turvy day for Martin Truex Jr., guys. He had that penalty of speeding down pit road, came back in, he was doing okay, working his way back up, and then he came in and pitted, and they said that the pace car beat him, so that naturally put him a lap down. Well then, with that Jimmy Johnson incident, they got the lucky dog. So Martin Truex got back on the lead lap. He's fighting his way back up sixth right now. But the trick is he stayed out the last two caution flags. The team thinks they're going to be just fine with the way this race is unfolding. So, so far, so good right now for Martin Truex Jr. running sixth, and he started 33rd. Talk about uh, showing some strength here the last month or so. The Dale Earnhardt Incorporated cars. Truex, the top of those, he is sixth overall. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is ninth. You see now the new team additions, Mark Martin, by the way, back in there, Paul Menard, who got some uh, owner's points from the Gen merger, also there in the top 25. Tell you what, I totally agree with Martin Truex and one car standing out for track position, but Andy, you know, the fuel mileage is so important right here, and the distance these guys can run, 30 to 35 laps. Was that a mistake? Well, we've got a few different strategies going on right here. I think that they, they got enough window right now to take them out a few, you know, quite a few green flag laps. Nobody can make it on one more stop anyway here, so I think everything will shake out 
with an, and I'm sure we're going to have another caution. We've seen plenty of caution spikes today. All right, one of the drivers involved in an accident earlier in the afternoon, Casey Mears, standing by with Alan Bestley. Casey Mears back here in the garage where he doesn't want to be. Casey, what happened? I was I was uh, the 43 and I were both trying to get by the 70, and uh, I think I was just tucked up too close behind the 43 when we went into the braking zone, and the, my car just went straight, and I got into the 70 and kind of started that whole deal. Didn't mean to. Uh, we were just kind of taking it easy because we got in the back, just wanted to pick off one at a time, and and uh, I feel bad for everybody that was involved there. Just kind of unexpected, I guess. I wanted to go in there and just kind of follow the 43, and when I went in there, my front end just went straight. So um, I think it's because I was so close to him and just didn't have the air in my nose. But uh, yeah, I hate it for uh, Johnny and and uh, Elliot. Sadler and everybody that was involved. Um, the National Guard Chevrolet was pretty good. We were loose, uh, got, spitting, uh, got caught speeding on the exit of pit road there, and it got us in the back. And we we're just going to try to take our time and make our way through there. And, and really wasn't trying to be aggressive. I wasn't trying to get more out of it. It just uh, kind of caught me off guard a little bit. I think I was too close to the 43. Sorry, Rob. All right, this happened back on lap 54. The accident he's talking about Sadler, Mears, Johnny Sauter. See, gets down in the corner, a 38 car. David Gillen's behind him. Maybe got him a little loose on entry, but then he got really loose when he got alongside Johnny Sauter. And then all havoc breaks loose. You know, we've been showing you guys dirty air on draft tech all day long, and our draft track is correct. You really got to understand how to work the air to your advantage, especially at a track like this where it's so flat. And that's a perfect example of when the air can work against you right there. Tell you what the guy I've been taking a look at was Dale Earnhardt Jr. Now his last lap of 53-68. Well, get a load of this. Tony Stewart's rocking it around there at 52-30s. Dale's almost a second off the pace. They're going to have to work in this car. And if they're going to get back in the hunt, they're going to have to fix this fender, maybe right side this thing, get some track position, something. As a crew chief, what type of call would you make right now under this circumstance? They're going to have to make some kind of adjustment here to try to catch these guys. And uh, they haven't had a, a very many opportunities to adjust on the car, but I guarantee you there'll be wrenches flying when he pits next time. The 29 car, Kevin Harvick, uh, he was able to go by his teammate, top of your screen, that's a 31 of Burton a moment ago. Now he has gone by the 17 of Matt Kenseth. Harvick now being shown as high as he has been all day long in third position. Jerry, I see a lot of different cars now coming back to the front of this pack right now. These lead cars, Tony Stewart, Juan Montoya. Look at the big lead that Stewart's got now. And one thing I'm going to remind everybody of right now, this track changes big time. These grooves are really rubbering up with rubber. And the more rubber gets down, the tighter these cars get. And these teams are going to have to start making big adjustments. But it looks like Stewart doing the best job of it right now. Tony Stewart's got his car dialed in. He's got that clean air on the front end. Some of these other guys, I'm sorry, Jerry. Some of these other guys are going to have to start adjusting on their cars to, to catch them. Momentum is so important. Tony Stewart had gone 20 races without a win, and then last time out at Chicagoland in this very car, he led over 100 laps and is running awfully well again here today. Four times, and he is currently the leader with 24 laps in the books. Reed Sorensen, the pole sitter, led the first 16. And we have yet another yellow flag here for debris on the racetrack. This would be the eighth yellow of the day. They're saying the cautions for debris in the front straightaway. Try to get on that and find out where it's at right now. But I'll tell you, NASCAR's got a great way. Many cameras up against the wall. Tell you what's a good call, because you don't want to run on debris in the front straightaway. It's right about the flag stamp. You hit that, man, you're going to blow a tire out like Jimmy Johnson did, and we don't need that. The problem with all this debris on the racetrack is all these cars that have been involved in these wrecks. They patch them up and send them back out there. See one going by right there. All taped up. There's another one. So you see all this debris that flies off the cars, and that's what's causing these cautions. Yeah, one guy didn't mind this yellow flag at all was the 21 car of Bill Elliott. He got the free pass, and so he gets will be able to get back on the lead lap, and that puts us now with 32 cars on the lead lap. So right now, I think this is a great opportunity for Dale Jr. He's about there's 71 laps to go in this race. I would take the time right now, fix this car, get himself back in the game because these track conditions are definitely changing. This track is definitely tightening up. And one key thing is, is most of these guys, if not all of them, can go make it on one more pit stop from here. The average pit window, 34 to 35 laps. So one more stop from here. And again, uh, this, these adjustments, these guys probably didn't want to see a yellow flag. They were just checking out Tony Stewart's bunch, but Juan Pablo Montoya 
has gotten stronger and stronger. You know, he's a good road racer, but he has not won on an oval, although he had some success early on at Mexico City in the Bush Series car, but that was on a road course. Oh, it's big, you know. We got this one out of the way now, and you know, the next one we need to win in an oval. I want to win in an oval. You know, that's where we need to be good. Juan Pablo Montoya has had success uh, in a lot of different venues. He won the Indianapolis 500 back in 2000, dominating as a rookie driver. The Grand Prix of Monaco, the crown jewel of the Formula One circuit in 2003. At Mexico City, stop number seven, his seventh start in a NASCAR Busch car. Only his 17th career start in a NASCAR Nextel Cup card in Finneon. And today, he makes his 21st career start ever in the, the car owned by uh, Chip Ganassi and Felix Sabatis, trying to get his first oval track win. Guys, I tell you what, I don't know if you agree with what I'm about to say, but he has definitely exceeded my expectations. Montoy has been in the top five ever since this racetrack started, since this race has started. All right, pit stops are going to become the order of the day here under the eighth caution flag. And major adjustments for a number of cars, including the eight car of Dale Earnhardt Jr., who was so good early on, but had drifted back now to the eighth position. They're headed down to you, Jamie Little. And Martin Truex Jr., as we were talking about, big sigh of relief for this team. They were just three laps away from having to pit. As I said, they stayed out those last two cautions. Martin Truex comes into his pit box, just going to do one round down on that track bar, make a small air pressure, pressure adjustment, take some right sides there, and fuel. go over to the left side, take two more tires. Let's go down to Mike. There may be a little bit of pressure on the 29 over the wall crew after the last stop. Kevin Harvick came over the radio complaining that they were losing spots on pit road. This one, though, very clean. Four tires and fuel. Juan, Juan Pablo Montoya's crew chief, Donnie Wingo, says they're very close on the chassis. They're not going to win the race off pit road here, though, Dave. Tony Stewart's going to try. He's not going to do it either. Just a four-tire stop with a little air pressure out of the right rear just to tip loose. They didn't want to change it much. They didn't want to change their track position either, but that's what happened. So many various pit strategies. There's the race off of pit road. Greg Biffle's bunch gaining 14 spots. David Gillen driving for Robert Yates up 14. Clint Boyer, 16 positions. They were the big winner here in this stop. Just like we talked about at the beginning of the show is taking chances and rolling the dice. These guys are taking a chance by getting two tires, no tires, fuel only. They want that track position. And here's the crew cam off the five car. Fuel carrier and tire catcher. He's trying to catch these tires as they come off the car so they don't bounce out into the racetrack. Great pit work for Ron Sipka and company for Kyle Busch. Back with a green flag at Indianapolis in a moment. There is fluid on the racetrack. We were getting set to go to green, and the uh, spotters around here noticed some fluid coming out of one of the cars. We just had the double zero, by the way. David Rudeman come down pit road because of smoke in the cockpit. There's where the fluid came from out of the double zero. So we will take uh, a few more laps, take a break, and come back with a green. Did you of earlier today? Six of our last nine winners here have gone on to capture the cup championship. Jimmy Johnson, of course, has been knocked out because of the fire, so we will not have a repeat champion here today before a crowd of 250,000, Susie, and uh, there's not a seat to be had here. That's for sure, and this is one of those races. You win it, you get the attention of the garage area. Let's focus on Greg Biffle, who's the leader right now, who brought a new car to Indy this weekend. So do you think he's really for real right now? I uh, haven't really seen him show that right now uh, throughout the race, but a lot of things happen later as this race goes on. We heard Rusty talk about the track really rubbering up, so Greg may have his car where he wants it now. He may have been so loose earlier that now it's just starting to come around. This would be a huge shot in the arm for Greg, too. He has a new crew chief this year, and they've struggled this year, both in the Bush Series and the Cup Series, so hope he can stay out front and get some, lead some laps and maybe get some confidence. You never know what can happen. Well, one thing we've also seen is this race has a way of propelling drivers into that chase for the next Cup Cup championship and Biffle right now is 16th man could this do a lot for his season Well, it really could especially with Ryan Newman going out today and uh, Carl Edwards is having some problems Jimmy Johnson's had some problems but that 12th place spot could be up for grabs as time goes on if they continue to chop away at it okay for the insight on Greg Biffle let's go to Dave and Susie he may get swallowed up at this restart it's been a hard day for Greg Biffle radio didn't work at the start of the race so when his car was flying the nose and absolutely hard to control 
he radioed into his crew chief, Greg Irwin, on what to do, but Greg couldn't hear him. So and they finally got a pit stop to work on things. They closed off the front shocks. They got that car to settle back down again. Greg just told me that he thinks, I still only think we have like a top 10 car, but we had to put the car out front in clean air to see what it would do. And if they can maintain that top 10, that's a lot better than they were earlier in the race. And guys, as we know, this race is just chock full of former Brickyard winners. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the interesting thing, too, we're getting down to 65 laps to go. We've spent so much time under caution. But you see all the winners here, Kevin Harvick, Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon, Bobby Labonte, Bill Elliott, Ricky Rudd, Jimmy Johnson. And uh, it's just outstanding field. And hopefully we're going to get some green lap. Uh, a green lap run here so we can watch the race. And of course, Jeff Gordon is in elite company. He's won it four times. This will be his drive for five. You know, it's just such a great feeling to, to experience what it's like to win an Indy. Jeff Gordon, winner of the inaugural Brickyard 400. It's awesome. I mean, you know, they're gritty and, and there's rubber and, and dirt and sand and everything else, and you don't care one bit. And it's extremely special to, to get that opportunity. Honda of Turnersville's 07 clearance is on. Which we welcome you back to the historic Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Laps are winding down in the All-State 400 at the Brickyard. Eighth caution flag of the day is complete. We are set for the green flag. And Greg Biffle, who had his troubles early on today, will lead him down for the first time today on the green flag. Well, this is the first time all day we've seen whether the two tires are going to work. You got Biffle on two tires, Stewart on four. We expect he's going to run up and just chew him up. But can Biffle hold on for a while and get, can maintain that track position? The top three cars, Biffle, the 07, a Boyer, and David Gillen, all three only took on two tires. For more on Gillen, let's check in with Jamie. Yes, and David Gillen making his first appearance here at the Brickyard, but his crew chief is Todd Parrott. Parrott knows all about winning here as he went to victory lane with Dale Jarrett. It's actually Todd that started the trend of kissing the bricks after a win, so he knows how to get it done. They came in on that last pit stop. David took right sides only. Car is good. Well, Jamie, whenever Tony Stewart comes to the Brickyard, there's a little pressure on him. He got rid of some of that pressure a couple years ago when he won here, but he tries to find ways to relax, and that often includes busting on his crew. He did so with crew chief Greg Zipidelli, who might sound a little nervous as well. Uh, can we get you a pillow or anything? Look like you're one step away from just being real super comfortable up there. Doing everything I can to try to relax there. Yeah, me too. They know, they've got a ra they know they've got a race car that can win this race. They just have to stay calm. Zippy is now in the unrelaxed position, taking notes, trying to figure out how to chase this racetrack to make that 20 car the fastest at the end. Doc? I love the humor from Tony Stewart. Hey, Zippy, are you, are you comfortable up there, buddy? You need a pillow? He's just trying to, Zippy's just trying to act calm. He's not <laughs> calm. He's just trying to put on that face. Inside, he's going, oh, man, what am I going to do next? we got another pit stop coming up. He's got all these things going through his head. And so he's just trying to put on a good face. You know what that tells me, though? When you hear Stewart being that relaxed and that humorous here with 61 laps to go, that tells me he knows he has got one good hot rod. But I'll tell you one thing Zippy's doing right now. He's taking a look at Greg Biffle on those two right side tires to see if it's going to work for him late in the race. He's got a little bit of a skirt flapping here is this is a side skirt that these guys use to take the sides all the way down to the racetrack and they actually grind on the track this one here has come loose maybe banged against one of those rumple strips like we saw yeah we see some damage on the front of the car too so he may have hit one of those strips on the inside of the racetrack dave have you got more on greg biffle yeah, nothing right now on uh, on that, guys. They haven't complained about it right now, or they pointed out to Greg, but that's not a big issue. Think about what he did last night, though, at O'Reilly Raceway Park here in the same town. I stopped Greg in the garage today, and he told me, you know what, last night I had a 10th place car at best. I found a place to run on that small track where my car would work that I'd never run before. He brought the car home second. He put on a great show, and he may be looking for a spot to run this 16 car today that will give him the same opportunity at the end of this race. He's able to hold the lead right now. His car looks pretty strong out there in that clean air. Just kind of a little bit worried about that flapping piece of aluminum on the side. 
I'll tell you what, right now, guys, Biffle just ran a 51.64 on speed compared to Tony Stewart's 51.78, so he's about a tenth of and a half faster than Tony. That's how big this clean air is. NASCAR, we're hearing right now in the next pit stop, is going to make Greg Biffle fix that air dam. Next, they're not going to let that thing flop around any longer. And they're going to give them to the next stop. All right, for exactly how and what they'll have to do, let's check in down our ESPN Dish Tech Center with our crew chief, Tim Brewer. Thanks, Jerry. What they're going to have to do is either rivet the thing back, then in my opinion, they're going to cut the thing off closest to the next rivet right there, let the rest of it go by the wayside. They're going to give up a little bit of arrow, but not enough to waste the time and lose the track position here at Indy. Uh, thank you, Tim, very much. Uh, looking at our Chevy cutaway car, you see exactly what they're going to have to do, although it'll be on a Ford when he comes down pit road for Greg Biffle. thing that concerns me is it's going to take some time for these guys to fix that. They better be getting a plan together to cut that off quick so it doesn't cost any track position. Yeah, and he better be getting a plan together for that 29 car that's coming in a hurry. Uh, the the uh, 29 of Kevin Harvick has not led the day. Started in the middle of the pack, kept coming to the front. He's on the march now. Has narrowed that lead to about four car lengths. But just then, the last time by, Kevin Harvick had the fastest car in the field at that time. And Biffle is back and forth. It's proven to me right now pretty good on the two tires. But you see him loose off of turn four, Andy. Greg Biffle drives the car harder than anybody I've ever seen. We can see him up on the steering wheel here, trying to hold the lead. Kevin Harvick's going to take it away from him right here. And we got Tony Stewart back there stalking these two. There's the man. Richard Childress owns the uh, Kevin Harvick car, owns the 31 car of Jeff Burton, the 07 of Boyer. Mike? You know, Doc, I had an interesting conversation with Kevin Harvick's crew chief, Todd Barrier, this morning, talking a little bit about the coil bind setup. He said that back in 2002, they were one of the first teams to start experimenting with that kind of setup. They brought it here in 2003, and he credits that for winning the Brickyard their first time. He said this year they still feel like they're on top of the game when it comes to coil bind. And he said that this weekend, Kevin has felt like his car is as good as it was back in 2003 when he went to victory lane. His car does look good. The only problem is Tony Stewart's looks just a little bit better. These children's cars do have a good handle on that coil bind setup. We talk about it all the time. This coil bind setup we're talking about is when you try to run these super soft springs in the front of the car. And the reason we do that is so you can you go through this NASCAR tech inspection and you have to meet a certain height. And so these guys put these soft springs in there, get the car height up. But when you take the car on the racetrack, the air pushes the car down and the banking forces push the car down. And then this shock holds that car in what we call coil bind. We see that spring compressed all the way and we call that coil bind. And it holds it really low on the racetrack all the way around. And then when the car slows down, comes back into the tech height, it comes right back up. And for more on this, we'll go right down to Tim Brewer in the tech center. Hey, thanks, Andy. We've got this illustration that Andy came up with back some years ago. This, folks, is the installed inspection height spring right here. But believe it or not, when the car's in compression, meaning the air dams all the way down, this is what the spring actually looks like sitting inside the spring bucket, and that enables the front of the car to come down, makes a tremendous amount of downforce, and this is ultimate coal binding. Yeah, that is great. And Andy, you developed that? Well, that's my spring he's holding right there, the one that's all compressed. That's the one we used to use to make all the spring buckets so we could maximize that coal bind setup. These guys have, have evolved that, that whole setup now where they uh, have a manufacturing process for all these arms just so they can make that all work. Well, guys, right now at the 16 car, Greg Biffle is really falling back right now on those two right side tires. Harvick and Stewart have basically checked out. So right now is how long can Biffle maintain on the two tires for track position? And that's what the key thing is right now. But right now, it doesn't look like it's working for him. He rolled the dice to get the track position, and now he knows how his car acts out front. If he could ever get some tires on the car maybe he, and make an adjustment, he might be able to make something happen with it. But the good news for Greg Biffle is that everyone's going to have to make one more pit stop. Come on the pit road. Kevin Harvick showing the way here with just 55 laps to go. Kevin Harvick, who won at Daytona, is now our leader here at Indianapolis. He stands only eighth in the chase points, but he has earned over $5 million because of that strike at Daytona. Only two drivers have put together wins at Daytona and here in the Brickyard in the same year. 
Dale Jarrett, one of them who has joined us in the broadcast team, the other one a year ago, Jimmy Johnson. And right now, Doc, it is some duel for the lead with Tony Stewart right on his bumper. As you watch these two cars just chasing each other with 50 laps to go, we've had contact with the 40 car, David Strimmey. And he's gotten into the concrete. And here comes Tony Stewart looking to the inside of Harvick and just drives it right on by. And Harvick knows he can't hold him off going at the corner. He real wisely backed out of him. He's going to try him again, though. Backing out of the throttle. No, he's staying with him. But he's got that clean air to his right rear quarter panel to keep him tight. If he had got up side by side, there could have been a problem there. I think these guys are testing each other right here. We see Tony Stewart moving around on the straightaway, trying to get out, get, move out of the draft. And we see Kevin Harvick. He's trying. He, he got past, let him go, played a little give and take. And then he's trying to see where he can maybe pounce on him later. Now, these two guys got a pretty good relationship. Kevin Harvick owns the Bush team that Tony Stewart drives for occasionally. So they have a lot of respect for each other. They're good friends off the racetrack. And so... You expect that they're going to work with each other during the race. They're going to have a little fun right now, but they're not going to have, they're not going to be doing this kind of give and take at the end. Let's show you what happened a moment ago to the 40 car of David Strimmy. Guys, it looks like he got in the corner, got a little loose, got the left front corner low on the track, lost it and chased it clear up the racetrack, Andy, with the rear and out. It got in the wall. You can see that car not handling on entry. This track's so narrow that you just don't have enough room to catch a car when it does that. Some of these big wide racetracks with a lot of banking, you can just chase the car up the hill, but you don't have that room here. Tony Stewart is our leader, so uh, why don't we go up to speed, get our up sprint up to speed updates from the pit, starting with Dave Burke. And Jerry, when you've been to victory lane 30 times like Tony Stewart has, it can become a routine thing, but it's never passe. And when this team won two weeks ago in Chicagoland, it was cause for celebration. Talked to a crew member this morning who said it was big for two reasons. We won in 2007 for the first time, and we went to Indy without the monkey on our back that we hadn't won yet this year. That's important for this driver at this track. Mike? If Kevin Harvick goes to victory lane today, this team could point to the pit stop they made on lap 39 as one of the key moments. Prior to that, Kevin was very upset with the race car, saying it was pushing like a dump truck. They pulled the spring rubber from the left rear, and the car has come to life. Alan? Man on the move right now in this section of the race is Kyle Busch. He was shuffled back to 11th on that lap 77 strategy shuffle when they took four tires and other people got fuel only or just two tires. He is charging his way through the field. He's up to third place now. He just took that spot away from one Pablo Montoya, who today became the first man to run in all three major races here in Indy. The Indianapolis 500, the Formula One United States Grand Prix, and this NASCAR 400 miler. His car not gripping as much with the front end in the center of the corner as he'd like. Mike? Jeff Gordon looking for his fifth Brickyard victory, but it may take some work. He's been complaining a little bit about being tight in traffic. They tried to correct that on the last pit stop by raising the track bar, but still not completely perfect for Jeff Gordon. Alan? Dale Earnhardt Jr. is on the rally as well in this stretch of the race. His car's handling went away when they got on that stretch of taking just lefts or just rights as far as tires on pit stops were concerned. They made four tires on the last stop for Newell's. Now they're watching their way back up through the field. Junior running in sixth. Dave? And Alan, Greg Biffle is going in just the opposite direction right now as we look at Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin has gotten around him, and Hamlin doesn't have a race car that he likes either. Hamlin's car very tight. They got to better earlier in the day, but they plan a big air adjustment on the next stop to help Denny get that car back where it needs to be. Behind him now, Greg Biffle, and again, going the wrong way in a car that took on two right side tires last time. It didn't work out well for Greg. The car right now is so loose I can't drive it, according to the driver. And believe me, Greg Biffle can handle a loose race car. That is a bad race car right now. Jamie? Well, Dave, Mark Martin doing a heck of a job in that 01. He said before he got in the race car with this Gin DEI merger this week, there's so many distractions going on. He's the veteran on the team. Everybody's going to him for advice and for answers, what to do with their development program. He said he couldn't wait to get in the car, but today he's at his hands. This morning.
morning in contact twice on pit road Clint Boyer has gone to the back of the pack three different times today after that last pit stop and a strategy call by his crew chief he came out third took up second spot on the restart but now the handling is falling away and Clint Boyer has slipped back now to the tenth spot for the moment Dave. Reed Sorens and the pole sitter is going to try to get that spot from Boyer right now. They're recovering after a race car that's been very tight and no grip on the front end. They made an air pressure adjustment last time. Reed reporting, it's so aero tight, I can't do anything with it. Crew Chief Jimmy Ellis said, that's what happens here. Work with it best you can, driver. Jared. All right, thanks, guys. 44 laps to go. Pit stops, uh, probably the window would open in about 11 or 12 laps. So but right now, it's all about Tony Stewart and the 20 car. Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s onboard camera. Earnhardt Jr. riding back in sixth position. He was a major factor early on. He has led twice for 33 laps. Pit stops coming up here momentarily. Starts Friday. Back with you from Indianapolis Motor Speedway, 41 laps to go. Let's check out the highlights in the McDonald's race rundown. The start of the day belonged to Ganassi Sabatis, who owned the first row. They did a great job. Reed Sorts, 21 years of age, led the field down, had a good start, got out in the clean air, and had a good run out front. What a tough day for the defending champ, Pete Johnson. All started on lap 45 when he got spun around. Yeah, you just get caught up into things, and then one problem magnifies into another, and then it ends their day. Yeah, he hit the wall at 200 miles an hour. He said it was the first time that he's got flames in the car. Kevin Harvick took the lead for the first time on lap 103. He won from the pole here in 2003. Well, I tell you, Kevin's been strong all day long. He's starting to lose a little bit of that strength, but he's had a good run thus far. On lap 110, he was passed by his friend Tony St Tony Stewart, who won here in 2005 for the fifth different time he's led. Yeah, Tony Stewart loves this racetrack, and I think he showed us right from the drop of the green flag that he meant business today, and he's got his car out front right now. Yeah, Tony Stewart is known for winning in bunches. He's won back-to-back -back races six different times, Doc. Susie, Tony Stewart setting sail here with 39 laps to go. You saw the pass on Kevin Harvick just a few laps ago. Now, Kevin Harvick has some issues with the handling on the car. Let's listen in. What he is talking about is the lack of grip on the car and how the car reacts. And when we saw the pass a moment ago with Tony Stewart, it was a it had a huge effect on the air. Let's show you with our draft tracks exactly what was going on between the 29 and the 20. Now let's take a look at this this last lap. The 29 car is leading. Tony Stewart's behind him. They race down in the corner. Stewart gets right on his bumper. That high pressure air. Moves back over to front of Stewart. He's got clean air now. He makes a pass on the bottom. Now let's take a look at the 29. He gets in the clean air, makes the wiggle because it pinned the front of his car. When it sticks to the front, the rear end got loose then. So as you can really see, let's take one more look at this. Harvick gets underneath him. The air attaches. Now he tries to pull the nose down underneath, and he's in clean air now. More pressure on the front nose makes the car loose. Okay, now one more time. Harvick does the fake. Tony doesn't go for it. He goes to the inside. He's got clean air in the nose of Stewart. Front end stuck good. He makes the turn. Harvick makes the crossover right here. He gets clean air at his nose, but also it makes the back of his car loose a little bit. But so that's a good illustration of the draft track, guys. I'll tell you what. And that's exactly, Jerry, what it feels like in a car when you're driving that thing. Never been able to see the air or the implications of the air before, but you've been able to feel it now as a driver. How does it feel to be able to see what was actually happening? Well, it's pretty cool to see what happens, but you know, as a driver, when I'm out there running, I get real, real loose, and I go to my crew chief, and I'm like, fix this car, what'd you do? Maybe the first early stop of the, uh, the final stop, it's Matt Kenseth in the 17 car coming down at 55 miles an hour. To Mike. And Matt Kenseth in now, he's been complaining a little bit that he's been tight on exit, and that's been the complaint throughout the course of the day for the 17 team. They put a wrench in the back, they'll make a chassis adjustment, a four-tire change in fuel for Matt Kenseth, but clearly he's not completely satisfied with his race car just yet, but he's away. Well, Matt Kenseth's not going to be able to make it to the end of the race. He's not inside his fuel window, there's 37 laps to go, so 
I don't believe he can make it on this stop right here. He's one of the first ones to pit. His last stop was on lap 91. But there's something called uh, trying to pit early and hoping maybe you get a, you know, some strategy move possibly. Uh, my, my feeling is that he needed to pit. Juan Pablo Montoya in the 42 car being shown in fourth position. Here comes the 16 car Biffle. Remember, they got to repair that valence or that, that skirt on the left side. Let's go down to Dave Burke. As he makes a long trip down pit road now, Greg Biffle will get four tires this time. Remember, only a two-tire change last time. Extra time spent working on that car now. Uh, they may go to the valence. They may not. They're staying on the top of the car, get a windshield tear off. Looks like whatever it is may be acceptable right now. They're going to change tires on that left side and get the four on it. The loose condition was the worst thing for Biffle, and now they go down below to try to cut that off right now. That was the last thing they did, and they pull it away as Biffle pulls away. We saw that windshield guy tearing that windshield tear off, and we kind of wondered why he may not go down and cut that piece off. The only thing that guy can do, and the only thing he's approved to do, is to work on the windshield and service the driver. So if he would have, if he'd have done that work, they would have been penalized. They had to wait for one of those other guys to come there and make that, make that change. And more pit stops taking place. Let's go down to Mike Massaro. And the call is a four-tire change this time around for Dave Blaney. Twice today, however, they've opted for two tires. I was told, one, though, once was an actual mistake, but they learned from that mistake. They saw how the car reacted. That's why they did it later in the race. But this one's a four-tire change for Dave Blaney. And here's the sixth car. David Reagan took over driving this car for Martin Martin, who left Jack Roush a year ago. And Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the eight car. Boy, do these guys really need to get this car dialed in for a little lead. Alan Bessler. Well, Doc, Dale Earnhardt Jr. had rallied up to sixth place before the pit stop. Remember, he was back just outside the top ten. But he says the front end grip has gone away on the car. So they're going to make an adjustment to try and help him with that. A four-tire change. And perhaps the most important thing on this stop, that big can of gasoline in the right, uh, the left rear corner of the car. The fuel man has to get the car packed absolutely full of fuel if they're going to have a shot at making it to the finish of this race on that stop. Four tires. Car was a little bit tight. He said he couldn't get off the corner. They just took a four-tire change in fuel. No major adjustments. To Dave. pit road now is Tony Stewart in the 20 car. It's a long trip down. He follows Ward Burton down pit road. For Stewart, there's a couple of things going on. First of all, execute the perfect stop, but also the temperatures on his car are low enough that he can stand a little tape on the grill. A small piece of tape will give him just a little more downforce. He said that last run, he, uh, the exit was better, but it was too tight in the center. So he wanted the air pressure back with a little tape on there. It should work a little bit better through the center as well. Four tires for the leaders. Mike. You heard Kevin Harvick complaining on his radio about losing grip. Well, he's digested it a little bit, thought about it, and he thinks the air pressure was a little bit too high. He radioed that back to Todd Barrier. They're going to make an air pressure adjustment, lowering the air pressure on the 29 car, hoping that brings that car back to the field that Kevin was liking earlier in the race. And here's the five car, Kyle Busch, who was being shown as a leader after Tony Stewart and others had pitted. Harry Labonte going out in the 55 and the five coming in. Very careful to avoid contact here on pit road. Alan Gustafson and crew are waiting on this driver and Alan Bestwick is down there. Crucial that the driver not make a mistake and get a speeding penalty here, Doc. Crucial that the crew not make a mistake with the stop. This is the money stop if the caution does not come out for the rest of the race. A four-tire change on this five-car. Again, crucial to pack it full of fuel with 32 laps to go in the race. This would get them good to the finish from here and a nice stop by the Hendrick Motorsports Sports Crew. Okay? Denny Hamlin is in now. Air pressure adjustment scheduled for the 11 car. Remember, Denny was complaining that his car would not turn in the corners. Just trying to make that last little adjustment. And now it looks like they're going into the cowl there as well. He may have stalled it on pit road. He has. He's trying to get it refired right now. Hamlin, long time on pit road now as the seconds tick away. They've got the tires changed, but they don't have any fire in the hole. Trouble for Denny Hamlin. A stop that was supposed to take just 14 seconds is now going over 30. Still trying to crank the car over, and Hamlin's day has gone south in a hurry here on pit road. 
cars are so hard to start when they run out of fuel. It's, it's just almost impossible to get that fuel up there to it. These guys are really frustrated. They've got a can right there of fuel. They've got a little tube that goes down to the carburetor, and they're trying to get that fuel down in there. Maybe the tube has come loose. They can't figure out why they can't get any fuel to the carburetor. And this is an eternity for Denny Hamlin, who had driven this car all the way up into the top ten, and now. Rusty, this must be an empty feeling sitting there. Oh, this is definitely an empty feeling. I mean, something's definitely went wrong. They're not even moving quick around there. They're trying to get some more fuel back into it, but, you know, uh, to me, when you start putting that... Fuel, one line, 33 outside. When you start putting that fuel in the carburetor, Andy, you need to stay with it until that thing's running good and clean. Guy gave it a shot, ran back over, and it quit running because it just run out of fuel again. It's just so hard to get the car started. One of a little trick to get them to get them started when they run out of fuel is to just plug that gas can in there and leave the vent shut and try to pressurize that fuel cell and push the gas up to the carburetor. I didn't see those guys doing that. They had another system for that uh, with that little canister they had, and it just failed them. Well, pit stops have been completed. Now it's all about these guys sitting in the seats with the seat belts on in the final 31 laps. Tony Stewart, Kevin Harvick, Kyle Busch, Jeff Gordon, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. This telecast is available on ESPN HD presented by DirecTV. Keep another thing in mind about the Allstate 400 at the Brickyard. There are no flukes. Only the best win here. Our leaderboard, Tony Stewart, Kevin Harvick, Kyle Busch, Jeff Gordon, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. Doc, you couldn't ask for a better five coming down to the finish of this great race. And historically, we have seen this race become a real gunfight here in the final laps. Guys have made it up. Rusty Wallace years ago came from the back, came and ran people down. Dale Jarrett had two wins here, but one of those, he ran some folks down here in the final laps. 26 to go. How good is Tony Stewart? Well, let's check in his pits with Dave. And he's been back and forth on the radio with his crew, with Richie Gregson Fidelli. He wanted to talk to him about assessing the competition, and here's the conversation, or at least a part of it. One other thing on Tony Stewart's mind, fuel. Do we have enough to go to the end? Crew Chief Greg Zipidelli says yes, but concentrate on what is important, the 29 behind you, and they're trying to keep that in mind. Look at this, guys. Uh, trouble on the racetrack. The eight car is just abruptly slowed, and that should tell it right there. Smoke billowing out from beneath the Budweiser Chevrolet. Alan Bestwick. Uh, Tony Jr. just climbed out from the pit time. box, said the engine let go. They are done. Four. Good job, bud. Heard him say the power steering went at the same time. That probably means the front of the engine quit turning, whether it was a broken crankshaft. I wasn't, I wasn't that good shaft. on that run. I was a little tight off. And it was a year ago that Dale Earnhardt Jr. used a great top 10 finish to propel him into the chase for the championship. He came here on the bubble today as the last car in there. points. They get higher as the race goes on, whether it's shock or something. So once we figure and now this engine problem with 25 laps to go will not help him with just six more events here in the race to the chase I to get in. I think y'all do a good job there. I just think we got off base there with that experiment there in the middle of the race on the left side. That kind of took us out of the game, and we just kind of get back too late. We lost the step. What they're talking about is really the handling of the car. They're just kind of analyzing their race. That's not really what knocked them out of the race. The engine just failed, and he just he's done for the day. Tell you what, he was running in the top five throughout the day. I just started to say that that eight car is right there. And he got a, if they have the caution flags, he get a better finish. But look at that engine explodes right about the start finish line. He got the thing slowed down enough, not much oil coming out of it. He was able to control the car and get it off the racetrack. Saw Juan Pablo Montoya dodging parts that were coming out of the engine. Let's listen to it. Blowing up, blowing up. Come out the front. Now watch from Juan Pablo Montoya's onboard camera. Eight car blowing a motor in front of you. He's staying high. Stay low, stay low, stay low. They stay low. Just keep coming. It's still green though. Come on, caution, caution, caution. Get on by him. There you go. Caution's out. A little fluid on the camera lens. 
Looked like it was water and oil, everything coming out of it. Now, Andy said, he said, it's blowing up, it's blowing up. The pulley just came off. And if the pulley comes off, he's gonna lose power steering. Is that his first indication probably, you know? Well, that's the first thing he felt was the engine lose power and then he didn't have power steering, but we see some parts hanging down below the car. When you have something catastrophic, it can just, actually uh, the front of the engine just come apart and all those pulleys and, and belts just fly off of. Dale Earnhardt Jr. was the car to beat early on. He led twice for 33 laps. Let's see who's gonna come on to pit road. Earnhardt Jr. sitting in the middle of pit road with no power to get out of the way. And here comes cars down to make pit stops. Kyle Busch is there, the 17. He thought might not make it on fuel. He is back in and Earnhardt Jr. can do nothing but sit there and hope someone doesn't tag him. Jamie. Well, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s new teammate, Mark Martin, in his pit box right now. Four tires, only two gallons of fuel, guys. Going to be a four tire change here for Kyle Busch's team on the five. They were good to go to the finish on fuel. Looking to see if they can gain some track position here with a smooth stop. Pit stops completed, and there sits the eight car on pit road. Uh, as you see, Dale Earnhardt Jr., after having lost an engine, let's check in on our ESPN Dish Tech Center with Tim Brewer. Hey, Jerry, we're going to show you a couple of different scenarios here on our touch screen. You see this engine here? We can do about anything we need to. We're anticipating maybe an upper engine problem, maybe a valve spring broke right here, as you can see in the animation. Spring broke, what we think can happen. Drop the valve down just a little bit. You're going to see right here. Bent the valve. Next scenario you're going to see comes up, breaks the valve off, shoots it back up the intake runner, which come down, got on another cylinder, and we're going to go back and show you one more scenario we think might have happened. Lower end problem, come back in here, connecting rod, crankshaft, you'll see it heating up right here, therefore the bearing's going away from lubrication, lack of, or bearing malfunction. See the connecting rod bolts already broke on this side. Come back over here, continue, breaks the connecting rod, all the stuff flies out the bottom, catastrophic engine loss right here. Wow, perfect explanation, Tammy. For, for more information on how these parts and pieces work, log on to ESPN.com, search word know-how. Well, Dale Earnhardt Jr., who had a great qualifying start and led 33 laps early on, heads to the garage area here right now. The harmonic balancer's still there, and uh, the pulley's gone, and uh, I guess the motor broke, but, um, you know, we just you have bad luck every once in a while. We, are, we have great motors all year long, and I'm real proud of the engine shop, and that one was a good one. That's what keeps us running up front in places like this, and uh, we, need to, we need the same power the rest of the year. We just, we'll, you just got to take chances when you're trying to stay in that chase. And real proud of my team, proud of Budweiser and everybody that supports us. We had a good car today. I want to thank all the guys on the car back at the shop here at the racetrack because the car was fast, and I was really enjoying myself today. All right, Junior, sorry you're out. And the key for him is that he came in 12th overall in the point standings. He would right now be the final driver to make the chase. Now, Kurt Busch is uh, still in this race and working, and Kurt Busch could conceivably pass Dale Earnhardt Jr. And, and at the end of this event with six races to go in the race for the chase and move into 12th position. And let's check out our Allstate uh, Good Hands move of the race. It would be the 42 car of Juan Pablo Montoya making this good move to avoid all the water and fluid and debris coming out of the back of the blown engine on the eight car of Dale Earnhardt Jr. And on behalf of Allstate, they will donate $1,000 to the Urban Youth Racing School. As Juan Pablo Montoya gets the Good Hands, Allstate Good Hands move of the race award. Four of the top seven drivers have won this race before. Tony Stewart did it two years ago. Kevin Harvick won it from the pole. It is 20 laps to go. Who's going to get it? Here comes Harvick. Harvick's got the position. Get into turn two right now. Excellent turn two down that long back straightaway over 200 miles an hour. And he's got that clean air, guys, with 20 laps to go. And that's what's so key. That was a great move. He got it on the fresh tires. 
Tony Stewart has had the car to beat. Look at him, three and four wide up the back straightaway. 41, that was Reed Sorensen, the pole sitter back there. These guys are trying to get up here and dice it up with Harvick and Stewart. Here comes Reed Sorensen. Sorensen's put himself back up in the top five right now. Chip and Nancy Felix about us racing, looking good right now. Fourth, fifth in the standings right now as the race runs. Jeff Gordon, take a look at him. He's worked himself back up to the third position. Has struggled through practice. About not a good qualifying run, but he's in position right now. All right, with Tony Stewart and Juan Pablo Montoya both in the top five. Let's show you the results of the ATT uh, Crew Chief Challenge. Which former Indy 500 starter has the best chance to win today? Let's see what you voted here. And 50% uh, for Tony Stewart, 40% for Juan Pablo Montoya. That 42 car is on a march right now. You see him right behind Jeff Gordon, looking inside of Jeff Gordon. If you would have told people that a rookie driver would zip by Jeff Gordon, the four-time All-State 400 winner like that with 20 laps to go, they'd have told you you're nuts. But Juan Pablo Montoya is not your ordinary rookie. He has really learned this stock car business quick. He came in here with a lot of talent, but no experience in stock cars. You see Jeff Gordon really working him hard. You see the sparks fly when he gets on the brakes. He's really, this is the time these guys got to go as hard exit. as they can. Awesome exit. And Andy, we heard earlier in the broadcast, Jeff Gordon complaining about the front end of the car falling a lot. Right now, he's, it fell down, it sparks flying out from Ethan. And look how much lower the air dam on the 42 car is versus the 24 of Jeff Gordon. So it's got to have something to do with handling. A visible difference right there. You see, they get down in the corner, all, both the front ends go right down on the racetrack, but on the straightaway, it looks like the 24 car does have a little more air gap. About a three-second differential from where these guys are. This is third and fourth, Montoya and Jeff Gordon from the leaders. Got to hand it to Harvick. He just blasted off on that restart. He, had, he was on a mission. He knew what his plan was. Boy, you got that exactly right. If he's ever going to get this thing right, it's right now. Dale Jarrett, you've been in this position a million times, buddy. You know exactly what Harvick's feeling right now. Yes, yeah, a great feeling to be out front, but I'd be very concerned if I were Kevin Harvick right now because Tony Stewart's car, I think, has shown all day that it's the best in the longer run. That didn't surprise me to see Kevin go by him. I think he knew that was his chance on that restart, so he was going to give it every effort that he could uh, to get by Tony and see if maybe they could get a caution uh, somewhere here in these next uh, 10, 15 laps that would keep him out front, and his car seems to be better on the cooler tires, but I would be concerned about having Tony Stewart coming back there. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that clean air, the 29 car Kevin Harvick's got right now, as you know, is monumental. But Harvick, it seems like as the race runs on, his car just keeps getting quicker and quicker. And that's probably the thing that uh, I would say that Kevin Harvick's concerned about right now. But Tony Stewart, with that great handling car, he's been having all day. Yeah, you got two guys that obviously know how to win this race. It's going to be a, a, a great show here at the end. And back to Montoya, who's done a terrific job. I've been watching him a lot of the day here. He, he takes a little different line. We saw him when he passed Jeff Gordon. He didn't get in the corner quite as hard, but he really charged off the corner. I don't think you can count him out here yet, especially if we'd have another caution. Well, I'll tell you what, that last lap, Kevin Harvick just ran a 52-10 to Tony Stewart's 51-95. So that last lap, hey, you're right, Stewart was faster. Stewart's got a run on him right now, Dale. Yeah, Tony's got, I mean, he just seems to, to his car doesn't abuse the tires, and, and Tony does a good job of keeping the tires there, letting the pressures come up. It just seems his car gets better and better. But as we know, you can have a really fast race car, but you get to the bumper of that car in front of you, makes it difficult to pass. Tony Stewart has caught Kevin Harvick, and as you heard Dale Jarrett say, catching him may be something else. This was a spot a few laps ago, or about 25 laps ago, that Tony Stewart was able to make the move inside. Yeah, these guys were just playing around about 20 or 30 laps ago. They're not playing around right now. It's only 15 laps ago, and I don't think you're going to see Harvick just give Tony this spot. Did you guys just hear what I heard? Stewart going here, kitty, kitty, kitty. I'll tell you what, he's, he's reeling them in right now, and he feels, look, there he goes. Tony Hard left. We saw these guys giving and taking 30 laps ago, and they're not now. You can see Harvick wants this win. He says, okay, if you want the top side, go ahead and take it, but I'm not going to let you have that bottom. These are two tough characters right here, and Harvick's not giving up, but I'm telling you what, Stewart's got his number right now. He's reeling them in. 
And when he said here, kitty, kitty, that's a lot of confidence in a driver that he knows he's got a real hot rod. DJ, what do you think of that? Well, he's got to be feeling good, huh? Hey, yeah, yeah, I don't think that any of us have ever uh, said that Tony wasn't a confident race driver, and he knows what his car is capable of right here. Very interesting to watch Kevin Harvick as they go down the straightaway. You see him pull to the inside. He's trying to break that momentum. He saw Tony come at him really hard the last time when he stayed straight, and that helped Tony get to his bumper. So he's trying to break all of that draft that he possibly can. I'll tell you what, I remember a million times when I was, I, I got open to my mouth and said, yo, I got it covered, but the fat lady wasn't singing, and I ended up losing it, so I wouldn't get too confident. But Tony shouldn't right now because he's still in second spot. We've been seeing on draft tracks how these guys have been fighting that dirty air. And you see right now Tony Stewart is fighting that dirty air off of Kevin Harvick's car. You just heard Harvick say he's only faster on the straightaway. It's the only place he's beaten him. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if, if Harvick can maintain the handling of his car, keep hitting his marks, and not get the car loose or get the front end slide, he might maintain. He had a, just a little bit of wiggle right there in that corner. Rusty Wallace, twice I saw you lead this race with 13 or less laps to go. This has got to be deja vu for you as you're watching Tony Stewart now try to get to the inside. Harvick trying to squeeze him down, and Stewart can't get it done. I tell you what, this is, this is a key part. I've lost two of these races, one with 13 to go, one with 10 to go, and right now this is just about the same time that Kevin Harvick is. I mean, he has got his hands full with Stewart. Stewart wants to win this thing. And you're looking at two drivers that have won the Brickyard 400 before. These guys know how to taste these bricks, and they both love it. That was Greg Zipadelli, by the way, the crew chief for Tony Stewart, and Delana Harvick, the wife of Kevin Harvick. And uh, it looked like uh, Zipadelli was pretty comfortable just laying back there, just sitting there relaxing, and you would think he was the one leading, but it was Harvick. No, he's not comfortable. He is nervous as a cat. We heard that cat <laughs> sound a while ago. He is so nervous. These guys are driving their guts out, driving. Look at this, 100 and not, 201 miles an hour getting down in this corner. And they're a little bit deep into a run right now. They're still running 201. Now, let me tell you what. I bet Kevin, I bet Tony Stewart's not as confident right now as he was. He just can't seem to run Harvick down right now. He's fighting that air. We've shown it to you all day. He's, they're fight, he's fighting that dirty air off of that 29 car, and he can't get by. You saw our draft track all day long, folks. The blue really screws the car up. Mike, you got more? Well, you guys are talking about how nervous he might be. Well, he might not be nervous at all. In fact, this driver has exemplified some traits of poise under pressure over the course of the weekend. We've heard stories over the years about great athletes being calm under pressure. What comes to mind? Tom Brady taking naps before the Super Bowls. Well, yesterday during practice, Kevin Harvick was sound asleep behind his race car during that race, uh, that rain delay. That shows you that he was not amped up at all this weekend. This situation, however, may escalate the adrenaline a little bit. What do you think? Tell you what, if, he, if Tony can get his front bumper to the back of the 29 to get him arrow loose and let him wiggle up the racetrack, I think that's the only way that Stewart can get underneath of him. Talk about composure. Peyton Manning used composure and poise to bring a Super Bowl win back to Indianapolis. Kevin Harvick trying to use poise and composure and the, the rear bumper of a Chevy Monte Carlo to bring a victory back to Richard Childress. He opens the door. Inside here comes corner. Stewart. Inside. This is the best shot Tony's had right here. And he does, he gets the Kevin Harvick clear. Okay, he does a swap over underneath. He's Looking got the inside, clean air. Oh, they bang. I gotta tell you, I don't think I'd have done that to Tony Stewart now. When you body slap this guy, you make him mad. He's like a rattlesnake, man. He's not gonna like that at all. Yeah, you're tugging on Superman's cape when you bump into Tony Stewart, but Kevin Harvick doesn't take much either. These guys are friends off the track, or at least but right now, they are mortal enemies on this racetrack. 10 laps to go in the All-State 400. Look at Tony Stewart's hands on that steering wheel. And Harvick knows if he gets to his bumper, he can get him loose again, but right now, it could be color me gone right now for Tony Stewart. He's got that clean air. That's what he needs. And you can see 
Juan Pablo Montoya now is starting to run these guys down. He's entering the frame. There's the 42 car right side of your screen, Montoya. And you heard Dale Jarrett say, I wouldn't count Montoya out. And he is closed by about a second on these guys over five laps. I tell you what, the 42 car, Juan Pablo Montoya, he's going to need some help, maybe a caution flag or something like that to close him back up. Alan, you got more? All while Tony Stewart was trying to pass Kevin Harvick, Montoya's spotter, Tab Boyd, was coaching him, telling him when they get side by side, they're going to slow up together, racing side by side, keep pushing to get to them. He wasn't able to get on them. Now he's looking to get around Denny Hamlin as quickly as he can to try and challenge Kevin Harvick for second. Okay? Alan, when Tony Stewart was five years old, he came to this racetrack for the first time with his dad. They sat in the short shoot between turns three and four, and he could only see the cars as a blur, but under caution, they would slow down, he'd see the colors, and he'd smell the methanol. That was a day he knew he loved this place. That morning, he came here under the cloak of darkness in the top of a bus in the luggage rack. That's how he got here, and today, he's in the first-class ride that's leading the Brickyard 400. Guys, Tony Stewart said when he won this race in 2005, if you grow up in Indiana, a win at Indianapolis Motor Speedway is the holy grail. It's what you dream about, what you want. He got it here in 2005, and he is driving the wheels off that 20 car to get win number two here today. Jerry, right now, Tony Stewart is starting to hit his marks. He's calmed down right now. He just ran a 53-29 to Kevin Harvick's 53.80, so he's got a big speed differential right now. Well, we see Tony Stewart out front, but don't forget these two got together, and they could they could have a tire issue or a tire rub. We don't know if this caused any problem or not. We see these guys running together. As we see Tony Stewart get into the side of the 29. Knocks just a little bit of the sheet metal in. He's probably going to be okay, but I'd be worried about those valve stems after a contact like that. And I'll tell you one thing I just noticed. It looks like the left front fender of Kevin Harvick's car is bent under, meaning that he's lo losing some downforce in the 29 car. He just told us it's getting really tight. DJ, what do you think about this? this is late. There's pretty, a lot of contact going on with these guys right now. Yeah, there was a lot of contact for sure. And as we see Tony Stewart, uh, I, I consider him one of the best at uh, car control. Car must be pretty good. He's getting a drink while he's going down the straightaway here. So Tony's pretty relaxed at this. He took his both hands off the steering wheel. <laughs> I think I could win with a car like that. <laughs> really? It's a wonder he isn't changing the CD in the car. I mean, he's so <laughs> relaxed in there. Hey, DJ, have you ever been this relaxed leading at a, at a place like this? You know, I was going to make the comment while go the hardest thing to do as we see Tony working the steering wheel is he's really loose coming off but he has such great car control uh, I don't know that I've ever been that relaxed no out front is really the hardest thing to do is to lead this whenever he was behind Kevin Harvick with Kevin being in the front there that's the hardest thing to do is knowing exactly how far you can take that thing down in the corner because you don't want to give that inside but you got to be able to carry that momentum but uh, Tony's obviously a great talent and uh, knows his way around here and, and just something about Indianapolis that brings out the very best in him. Man, if you got that right, I'll tell you what, right now, though, it's looked like a race for second place. Kevin Five Harvick has got Montoya behind him, and Montoya's about three tenths of a second lap faster, so he's got time to get around him right now. Yeah, he does. I think that contact between the, the 20 and the 29 knocked that left front fender in on, on Harvick's car, and we've talked all day about how aero dependent these cars are, and that's probably hurting Kevin Harvick uh, through the center of the corner and his exit right now. Well, I'll tell you what, Kevin, uh, Jeff Gordon, he's about the fastest car in the field right now. He just went a 53.70 compared to Stewart's 53.80. So, look, he's just going to run out of time, it looks like, to get up there. But he's definitely the fastest car at this point. And look at his teammate, Kyle Busch. Yeah, the five car took on tires on that last, uh, last caution flag. And he is making some fast laps right here. But I think he's going to run out of time. Here's Montoya making a run on that 29. Juan Pablo Montoya started on the outside front row, started second. If he can make this pass, he could possibly finish second. You know, Kyle Busch and his team took a big chance there in, in coming to the pits to getting tires as we see Montoya try to get to the inside. But I think they were counting on maybe one more caution during this and they could pick off some cars. They've got themselves in a position now that if that caution would have come five laps ago, they might have had something. This is a great battle for second place right now as we see Harvick uh, trying to do that crossover move. But what a great day that uh, Juan Pablo Montoya has had here in Indianapolis. What? Well, I tell you what, that 29 car was rough, and that 42 of Montoya up with his aerodynamic maneuvers, and it looks like he's going at it again, and look at the 24 of Jeff Gordon. 
passing on the high side. That's no man's land up there, guys. That's about the first pass we've seen on the outside. And here comes the five car. So Harvick has lost two spots, could potentially lose three spots as Kyle Busch will try it on the inside. The one place we've seen Tony Stewart be vulnerable is on a restart. So if we happen to have a caution here in these last four laps, Mon Pablo Montoya might even have a shot at it. And Reed Sorensen now pulling up in the 41 car. He was the young pole sitter today. He will try to move to the inside and take the fifth spot away from Kevin Harvey. Dale, I'll tell you what, you got to hand it to Chip and Nancy Felix about his race and Montoya running second. And Sorensen just pulled up in the fifth place, man. Pretty good run for him. Yeah, it really is, Rusty. You know, I've made notes here all day, and, and this is to compliment the Chevrolet teams on their aerodynamic, uh, that they're taking advantage of, of what they have there. They've got a great package. They make it work everywhere, and they're in engine combination, but you really have to hand it to those Ganassi cars. Uh, Montoya and Reed Sorensen have done a terrific job. They've got those two cars in the top five, and that's a really great day for them. Three laps to go. Tony Stewart has led 62 laps. Tell you what, you take a look at Jeff Burton, too, now. He's up there. The problem is, there's two laps to go. These guys are starting to run out of time. And Tony Stewart's just getting ready to smell some victory. But I'll tell you what, Montoya, that last lap by fastest car in the field, Juan Pablo Montoya. And this guy is surprised everybody to come here, never run at this racetrack in his life, and be running second right now to a veteran like Tony Stewart at the Brickyard 400, the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Tony Stewart can smell this second Brickyard 400. He's real close to getting that white flag. Yeah, if he gets that drink bottle out and takes another drink, now that's going to be really adding something to this. He doesn't have to show off quite that much. i tell you what, that makes him a pretty good driver. Right, if you can... right here. One, more. One more. All right, Tony Stewart comes by. He had not won a race in 20 starts dating back to last fall. And then two weeks ago, he took this car to Chicago Land Speedway and spanked him. Led over 100 laps and said, guys, that has now become my favorite race car. I want to take this car to my home track. So they brought it to Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a track, as you heard, that he came to when he was five years old, riding in a luggage rack on top of a bus, covered up in coats so he could watch these guys race. It's a track that he has dreamed of winning time and time again. He won here in 2005. And once again, with the help of that guy right there, Zippy, Greg Zippinelli, Tony Stewart will come down here in 2007 and take the win in the All-State 400. Tony Stewart wins it. Take, take a look at him, guys. A lot of confidence. It's two wins at the track he loves so much. One of the favorite tracks. It's a kid he always wanted to win here, Jerry. He's got two of them now. He ran the Indianapolis 500 five times. Never won it, won it two so badly. And now he has two wins in NASCAR's Elite Division, the Nextel Cup Series, in just nine starts. And he made it look easy in total domination almost casual at times driving that race car. I knew he had a good race car, but when I saw him driving down the straightaway with no hands, taking that lead, I just, you know, you, what do you do? You can't beat a guy like that. Had a great car. Yeah, I've gone through the fast food line at a, uh, before I was driving with my knees when I wanted to order, but I'm never on a racetrack at 200 miles per hour. Oh, looks like a little payback from earlier. Tell you what, I don't know if they're mad at each other, giving each other a <laughs> yeah, kiss right there. They that get along be. pretty good, those guys do. That could be just a little congratulations right there. It sure could. Got to be proud for Tony. He might want to. He might want to dent that car up a little bit. He's tired of getting beat by. It. That's two in a row for Tony in that car. Well, I don't know what type of kiss that was, Jerry, but they just called the 29 driver to the hauler. They want to talk to him about some rough driving just then. Well, they want to have a little discussion with Kevin Harvick, but here comes 36-year-old Tony Stewart, who grew up just 45 minutes away from Indianapolis in the towns of Columbus and Rushville, Indiana. Let's go down to Allen. With the winning crew chief, Greg Zipidelli, who just watched his driver come by to begin what I'm sure will be a very noisy celebration. Relief or joy or a mix? Oh, absolute joy. Uh, obviously, it's a relief. Um, we had such a good race car, and, uh, you know, we've had them here before and haven't been able to close the deal. Um, for us to be able to do this a uh, second time, just um, the real deal, you know what I mean? This kid, uh, he's matured so much. He drove 
I can't even tell you what a phenomenal race today. Uh, proud of them. These uh, guys back home, uh, they didn't give up on us. They worked hard. They, uh, like I said, second time out for this car. We've won with it. They, uh, they worked their tails off on it. The body guys, engineering, everybody. I'm just so proud of everybody. I know you try as hard as you can to win every race that you can, but knowing how much this race means to him, do you ever feel yourself putting extra extra pressure on yourself during this day? It's not even explainable. Uh, the pressure you put on when you walk in that gate on, uh, on Friday morning, uh, the relationship Tony has to this racetrack and his history of growing up and what it means to him, it, um, you know, that makes it double of what you normally would if you had somebody that just wanted to come and win here. Congratulations, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Zipidelli, the winning crew chief. And we officially congratulate Team Chevy driver Tony Stewart, the winner of the 2007 All-State 400 at the Brickyard. Let's go down to Jamie Little. Well, Doc, it was his best start on a Noble, his best start in NASCAR second. He finishes second, his best finish on a Noble. So, Juan, take me through 400 miles in a stock car versus 500 miles in the Indy 500. I think it was a lot of fun. My technical Avalon Dutch car today was amazing. You know, I don't think anybody had anything for Tony today. He was just way too fast. But, you know, we played it smart and had a good race at the end. And, uh, you know, second here in, in the breakout, it's, it's just awesome. Where does this put you guys, your team, on an oval? How much closer are you to getting that first victory? Yeah, we're getting closer. We just got to get to a weekend, and we got to be the car to beat. You know, we, we're there already, but we just got to be the fastest car like Tony was today. Well, he had quick hands, guys, and he had a quick car finishing second. Go. Well, the signature for Tony Stewart, and listen to these fans, 250,000 strong as Tony Stewart gets out of the car and congratulates his crew, and we they know what's coming next. and congratulations down there. Got family here watching him win his second All-State 400. <laughs> Trying to catch his breath here. These guys, a, a lot of emotion. And there finally is Greg Zipadelli, dear friend and crew chief that helped guide this winning moment here today. I gotta hand it to the crew chief. He really did a great job getting that car handled. That is a dynamic duo right there. That's for sure. I'm surprised Tony hasn't hit the fence yet. I'm sure he's still taking in what just happened. You can see how much they like each other. They have a strong bond. Maybe he can talk Tony out of climbing that fence. <laughs> The I don't fans, think so, though. The fans know that he loves to get up on that <laughs> fence. He loves to get up there and wave to the crowd. And he said it takes a lot of energy. And sometimes when I climb out of that car, I don't have enough left. But he's going now, folks. Here goes Tony Stewart. Well, he's taking the whole crew with him. I tell you what, when that guy does that, it scares me. I just don't want him to fall off that thing. Joe Gibbs Racing Team, Home Depot Chevrolet for Tony Stewart, now a two-time All-State 400 winner. Jerry, I believe he's tuckered out. He usually goes all the way up to the flag stand. Let's go to Dave Burns. And he does it again, and I don't mean winning, I mean getting up and down there safely. Let you get a little, uh, little drink of water here. I noticed as we get the checkered flag, Tony, they haven't done any modifications for you up there. It looked as tough as it's always been to climb that dude. Yeah, it is. I mean, try it once. You'll see. <laughs> you commentators are getting real good about talking about it, but I haven't seen one of you do it yet. <laughs> Talk to me about racing the race car the way you did today. It was good most of the day, but there was a time when you didn't have the lead, and we wondered, could you get it back? We were about the only guy that could stay with anybody that was leading. Uh, this thing was pretty good in traffic there all day, and... I just went down into one on the restart and got really, really tight for some reason, and Kevin got biased, and then once we got going again, we could stay right with him, and I knew after about 15 laps we could get a run on him again, so I was just trying to be patient and got a good run on him off of one there and got by, so uh, that's a hard guy to race with. I mean, he's he's a clean guy. I mean, that's 
He's one of my best friends, and I can't think of another guy I'd want to race for the lead. He gave you a little shot after that, and then he gave you another nice donut on the side after the race. <laughs> Yeah, but keep in mind, he's the same guy who put the donut all the way down the side when I won in his first Bush car, so he's a good guy. I mean, that's the the two guys I had to race for the win these two years are, are guys that are good friends of mine. That's the way I want it to be. Another good friend was on top of the pit box today. You joked about Zipidelli needing a pillow halfway through the race, looking relaxed. With 10 laps to go, you're taking a drink out of the water bottle. You look pretty relaxed, too. I was thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I felt good in a car today. Just uh, It's still a long day here. All right, you win again at the Brickyard. Tony, can you put this one in comparison to the last one? This one's for every one of those fans in the stands that pull for me every week and take all the bullshit from everybody else. Tony Stewart, your winner at the Brickyard. The last time he won here, he went on to win next week at Watkins Glen. All right, take a look at our Crown Royal crowning moment in the final laps here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Kevin Harvick looked to have a strong car, but here came Tony Stewart in his Chevy Monte Carlo, shoved his way on the inside. Tony, who had the car to beat all day long. And when the checkered flag waved, it was Tony Stewart, the native Hoosier, and the entire Home Depot team who were climbing the fence.